Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our first virtual FreeBSD Developer Summit. We had a virtual vendor summit last November, and this is our first developer summit that we're doing purely online. So thank you for joining. Uh, folks, I know you can attend. If you registered on Eventbrite, you have access to our Zoom webinar, and you can join that way. We're also live streaming on the FreeBSD Hello, Projects uh, YouTube channel. Welcome to our first virtual FreeBSD Developer Summit. We had a virtual vendor summit last November. Okay, our Zoom, we had an echo for a bit there. Zoom is still fun. We are, we are figuring out how to do this with cameras, web cameras and microphones as opposed to in-person in a room. So it's always fun. So welcome to our developer summit. As I was saying, we are on Zoom, but we're also live streaming to YouTube. Um, we also, uh, if you want to our participate in- Echo for a bit there. Uh, Zoom is still fun. We are, we are figuring out how to do this with cameras. So it's always fun. All right, that was self-inflicted harm because I had not paused my YouTube. So <laughs> because you're streaming to YouTube, part of what we do with this is we, not only do we have a live stream to YouTube as well as the Zoom webinar, um, but we also have the ability for all our, our, our folks watching to interact with all the folks, all of us together as attendees at the Dev Summit. So there is a Dev Summit channel on FNet IRC that is bridged to the FreeBSD Slack instance. There's also a Dev Summit channel on our FreeBSD Discord space. Uh, and there's also a chat on the YouTube. So that's why I have YouTube open so we can watch all these different places so that as we're going through sessions and asking questions, these are places that you can ask questions. One thing we do ask is during our sessions, if you have a question, uh, if you're on one of our chat platforms, if you could prefix your question with a capital Q, perhaps in um, square brackets, that would be really helpful for us to identify the questions that, we, that you want us to ask and forward on to speakers. Uh, so let me go through the rest. Um, for our schedule this year, it's similar to some of our other uh, that's what we've had in the past. We have several different talks from different uh, developers and vendors who use FreeBSD that will be happening. We also have some working groups, which are kind of more discussion focused, where we will have one or more person share a discussion and then we'll kind of be open for questions and so forth from all the different attendees. Uh, Friday, we have a kind of panel with some downstream distributions that are kind of desktop oriented that will, where we'll have a set of representatives from those distros and then we'll have it open for questions. We also have a 14.0 planning session planned for tomorrow. And then two other things that we have, uh, most of our session run, most of our, our tracks run kind of in the first half day, Pacific-ish time for the US. And then we have some afternoon sessions that are a little more laid back. They don't have quite as constrained a schedule so today uh, we're going to take a break after our kind of main session for a while and then come back. And Kirk is actually going to do a talk. And so we, we've kind of called it Fireside Storytime with Kirk. So he's going to come and just talk for like a half hour to an hour about some BSD history. And that'll be on the webinar. And then uh, on Thursday, tomorrow, after our main session is over, we're going to have some short work in progress session talks where we will allow folks to kind of sign up um, you can sign up even today or tomorrow. Uh, there's a sign up on the FreeBSD wiki on the wiki page for our Dev Summit of a list of the kind of whips that you want to have. And we'll open the floor to allow folks to give short, brief five to 10 minute talks about any topic that's related to FreeBSD. The one thing beyond our kind of scheduled main track is we have also added uh, for this developer summit a hallway track, which is a separate Zoom call. So if you registered with Eventbrite, you got an email with two links. One of them is this webinar link, which is the main track. And the second one is a separate Zoom call, which is kind of 
what we were calling our hallway track. It's just a place where you can go hang out. You can interact with other attendees if you're not wanting to kind of be in the main track for a given talk or you want to have a separate breakout meeting, you can in that hallway track. It's a separate Zoom call, but you do have the ability to go into one of the three different rooms. Like you can grab a couple of people off into a side room. Y'all can have your own private conversation while you're there. And then when you're done, you can move back over to the main track or you can just hang out in the lobby if you want to chit chat with folks in person rather than text. Um, we, one of the things we do have in the main room over in the hallway track is we do have one of the screens as a stream or a copy of the main track, but without audio, so that if you're over in the hallway track, you can still have a sense of what's going on without having to have YouTube or something else open, although you're free to do that if you wish. One change, though, we did uh, make with the hallway track during testing yesterday, we figured out that we, uh, we had previously sent out a URL for the hallway track, and it didn't work, so we had to change it. There's a new URL for the hallway track, and we sent that link out last night. So if you try to join the hallway track and, and it, the meeting doesn't work, or it says you get an error saying that there's a meeting already in progress by the host, then please check your email uh, for an updated URL to join. A couple of other things before we move into our first talk for today. Um, one is that we will have a survey that we, will, we would like you uh, folks to fill out when you're done at the end of, of Friday. Uh, we'll be sharing that link to the survey at uh, the start of the session on Friday. I just wanted to kind of let you know that's going to happen so that you can be thinking about, you know, what your experience is like during the whole summit and if there are areas that need improvement, like me not having an echo set up by YouTube, but other areas besides that. Uh, and lastly, I wanted to thank a bunch of folks who have worked to make our Dev Summit happen. I wanted to thank the foundation, the FreeBSD Foundation, sorry, uh, as kind of our main sponsor. They're footing the bill for Zoom. They're uh, some of the other things that we're other things we're using to make this system at work. They've also put in a lot of time. We've been doing um, the folks that have been working with me on this on organizing this. We've been meeting once a week, and it's a lot of foundation folks on staff who are putting in hours to organize things and chase down speakers and get logistics right and so forth. So that's been very helpful. I want to thank all our speakers and our kind of people who are hosting our discussion groups um, for what the effort they're putting in and time to provide useful content and, and just talk to us about what they're doing with FreeBSD or help engage the discussions. I want to thank our panelists that are coming as well. And I want to thank all our attendees who are coming because uh, it is a conference that is all of us working together to do things to help promote FreeBSD and for the future of FreeBSD and projects we want to work on. And lastly, I wanted to thank the specific individuals who worked on our team to organize our Dev Summit this year, which would be Ann Dickinson and Deb Goodkin and Lauren from the foundation, as well as Ed and Mark Johnston, Ed Mast and Mark Johnston, who are also of the foundation. So all these folks, we work together to help plan, um, recruit speakers, kind of organize the schedule, logistics, do tech rehearsals on Zoom with our speakers and set the schedule and so forth. So I really appreciate all the work that these folks have done. And our first talk for today is actually going to be from Deb Goodkin and Ed Mast from the FreeBSD Foundation to give an update about what's going on with the foundation. So I'm going to turn it over to Deb. All right. I think Anne's going to turn it over to Deb. I don't know if I can tell. Okay. Uh, thank you, John, so much. And um, uh, besides, you thanking everyone who um, who helped organize and plan and, and run this event. I, I really want to thank you for all the work that you did. And uh, it seemed like usually our meetings happen during uh, John's lunch because <laughs> he was always almost always late coming to our meetings because he had to go out and grab some lunch. But um, but anyway, I want to thank you. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and. Um, you can get this to work. Here we go. So hopefully everyone can see uh, my slide. And that's purple. And let me get going. So anyway, so hey, everyone. <laughs> it is so nice to see you all. OK, I know I can't actually really see you. This, we're in this virtual world. But I know you're all out there. And this is just such a great opportunity for us to connect and uh, regroup and have hope that soon we'll be able to meet in person again. But also it gives us an opportunity to connect with people 
who aren't able to uh, attend our summits and conferences. And so hopefully going forward, that we'll be able to um, maybe do some of these virtual events too. So I'm gonna make sure that I don't run over. And so for the next uh, 15 minutes, I'm gonna talk about uh, what the foundation does. And um, Ed Mass is also gonna join me for um, a following 15 minutes and talking about uh, what we're doing in our technology and, and software development group. So here we go. So uh, we do get questions still, like, are you like, just like the Linux Foundation, uh, what does the foundation do? Who works for the foundation? So um, I'm gonna answer these questions. Founded back in March, 20, uh, 2000. And so we're actually over uh, 21 years old. And um, we are a 501c3, which means here in the US that we're a, uh, a public charity for the, um, you know, for the public good. And uh, we're, uh, so actually to compare against uh, other foundations like the Linux Foundation, which is a good example, just because they're so well known and, and so big, um, they are a 501c6. And the difference is, is that they're a trade association. And so their whole purpose is to support companies, which is totally fine. Uh, we uh, support both actually. Uh, we're based here in Boulder, Colorado. That's where I am. And, uh, but most of the team is based all over the world. We're 100% funded by donations. And we are separate from the FreeBSD project. And, but our whole purpose is to support the project and the community and uh, stepping in to advocate for FreeBSD to do software development, really to step in to um, help fill critical needs of the project. So these are like the six main areas that we support. And um, I'm not gonna go into each one of the, these, but uh, we will cover, Ed will cover what they're doing in the software development world. Um, here, we support summits and events and meetups, uh, you know, just like this and the one that we supported back in uh, November that John had mentioned that was a vendor summit. Uh, we plan on maybe hosting an in-person or hybrid type of summit again, the end of the year. And then hopefully uh, we're planning something in person uh, uh, next summer, so 2022. Um, we, I'll talk about what we're doing for education, legal, we support uh, FreeBSD IP and step in when uh, the core has uh, legal questions as well as advocacy. So speaking of advocacy, Here's a list of things that we've been doing and continue to do, and we'll also expand in many of these areas. So we do give presentations all over the world, and we do encourage to people from the community to also talk about what you know what you're doing, what you're interested in, and um, um, uh, the next thing is, and, and we'll also help you too if you need any help, and uh, we. Uh, produced the FreeBSD Journal. And uh, I'll talk about that too. We introduced the FreeBSD Fridays series uh, a year ago, and we've given 16 talks so far, and um, all of those are recorded, and I'll show you where to find that. Um, summits, like I mentioned, we've been writing up more blog posts and uh, promoting work uh, that's been done within the FreeBSD project, as well as the work that we've been funding. And we've actually been approached a lot more in the last few years on from a journalist to give interviews for other uh, technical publications. We've also connected them with folks within the community. And for 2020, where we'll help provide content for university college level uh, operating system courses. So we're currently in the research stage working with different professors around the world. And um, actually, I want to go back. Well, here, I'll continue really quick. Um, but here's other areas that we do support. We have folks on security team, cluster admin, uh, continuous integration. We actually are administrating the GSOC program this year and, and previous years, as well as we have team members on the core team, 
as well as we work closely with the core team uh, to support their needs. And, um, and actually that's where we're informed by, you know, what are those critical needs within the project? I'm gonna go back really quick, cause I think, here we go. This is the team. And I just wanted to show everyone, um, you know, who, who is working for the foundation. Some of these folks are part-time and um, some are full-time. I would say more than half are full-time. And I won't go into what everyone does because we don't have a lot of time here. But, um, but you know, and we do a lot of advocacy and that advocacy work is for the project. And so we have a very small team that supports that. Uh, Ed's group is growing. That's actually where we're focusing a lot of our funding this year. And so um, I'm really pleased that we just added um, Joseph Mingren as our project coordinator and he'll be working, he's working part-time for us currently and then he'll join full-time in a few months. Uh, same with Andy Turner, he just joined us uh, full-time, which is really exciting, as well as uh, the rest of the team. And, um, and, and, um, and Ed and Mark both joined us um, officially full-time as employees, which is really exciting. Uh, Brad Davis, most of you probably know him. Um, he's our, uh, he joined us part-time to support our, our IT, but also to help um, coordinate efforts between the foundation and cluster admin to help uh, get the hardware and support that they need. And uh, then you've probably met Lauren online as far as any, like our, she's our frontline person and helps with travel grants and, and all sorts of things. And then Greg is with us part-time and he does uh, most of our tech or a lot of our technical writing. So let me go forward here and uh, here's, uh, a graph of what our income, uh, which is basically donations that we take in versus our expenses. And it's been growing over the years and um, uh, from, from close to the start. And we, currently our budget this year is 2 million and um, about 1.1 million will go directly to operating system improvements. Uh, the rest goes, a lot of it goes to advocacy, education, and support within the project, like purchasing hardware, things like that. So what now what I would like to do is give you a tour of our website. And the whole reason why I want to do this is because I want to show you um, how you can get help and how you can find information. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, stop share. So you should see me back here and then I'm going to share. I know there's probably a better way to do this, but um, I'm going to share um, find it. Okay, if I switch to this tab, what I'm hoping is that I am sharing um, our website. And so if someone, if if someone on our team, if you could just confirm that. Um, actually, what I'll do is I will close that. And so hopefully you see our website. And um, so what I wanna do is, uh, like I said, is give you a tour. So you can find out all the information and resources that we have here to um, help you in what you're, you wanna do with FreeBSD. So first, I'm gonna take you to our resources page. And so just, if you watch me navigate, and you can always ask later too. Um, so we have FreeBSC resources, and uh, we've been providing this just to help make it easier to either get started with FreeBSC or to get started with what you're wanting to do. So it starts from having these how-to guides here, and from most basic running FreeBSD on virtual box to over here uh, contributing to FreeBSD as a programmer. Most of these are current. If they're not, it's uh, they just haven't been updated to 13.0 yet, but they're pretty close. And we're, uh, can, we're trying to uh, continue to um, update these. We also have a few video guides that we've been doing. And then as you go down, if you're interested in running your own install fast, like at a meetup or at uh, your school, then we have um, how to guides here on how to do that with a guide or guides on, you know, how, uh, what's, you know, what are the steps you should follow for doing that? We've been doing this for a few years now. So, um, so we've been refining that. And then down here, we have what we call community re resources. Uh, 
do that. Uh, also provide videos and blogs and webinars and things like that. And um, and here and so here is the link to our previous Fridays and then the office hours is provided by. Okay, so I heard that I'm stuck here. I am having some internet issues here. Um, so okay, but it looks like I'm okay. It but. Sorry about that. I don't know why that's happening. But I did want to highlight there's uh, two companies who've stepped in over um, within the last couple of years and um, who have stepped in to do FreeBSD development and support for uh, commercial users out there. And it really highlights that there is a need for this as well as a growth in FreeBSD. So the next thing I want to show you is um, under our work that we do have a lot of resources that um, you could, that's available to you. Say you're going to an event and you want to hand out stickers or a poster or talk about, well, we have a lot of old stuff here too, but basically it's a repository for, um, for literature, for content that you could hand out at meetups or conferences. Next, I want to go over our journal. And um, you know, it's probably like right in front of me. Uh, FreeBSC journal. There we go. Um, we we uh, published this professionally produced magazine journal with lots of uh, really good articles on uh, different areas of FreeBSD and it's free. And so you can click here to access the latest issue. Um, if you wanna see previous issues, you go here and you can find out um, if there's a subject you're interested in, you see the table of contents and you can click on an article and it'll take you directly there. And we will be putting these in a PDF form too. And then going back, I just wanted to highlight that um, we're, well, the uh, journal is always looking for writers. So if you want to write for a professionally produced magazine, uh, then contact uh, Jay Maurer at this URL. Okay, next, uh, you have a project that you're interested in doing. You can go to propose a project. And you can find out information about how to write uh, um, proposal and uh, submit it to us. And most of the time when we get it, we go back to you. We have, we have a um, reviewing committee and we'll typically have questions and we'll work with you and, um, and refine that, help you refine that uh, proposal. And then you just submit it here to proposals at freebsdfoundation.org. Um, next, I want to, I'm not exactly sure how I'm doing on time, so let me check that. Okay, um, let's go up here. And, uh, oh, I know, I wanna show you about uh, projects that we've supported or that we're currently funding. Oh, here you can find out events coming up, but what we do on our homepage, we have our featured projects and then, but you can view all of our projects. So what are we currently funding? So we'll say in progress, as well as what we have funded in the past. And so almost all those projects are listed on this page. Uh, there are a few that we're currently funding that haven't been added yet, and we're going to do that soon. Uh, let's see here. Um, and here's actually submission guidelines. This is a more in-depth explanation on um, uh, how to write. Talk about our team. So I did show you the org. But here's another way to see you know, who's doing what and what we look like, which in a virtual world, um, that's, it's really nice. And so our team members are here. And then we have a board of directors. And uh, so we have a page that shows who is currently on our board. We do have our annual board meeting next week. And so um, that's when we have elections for uh, new board members. And so anyway, you could see uh, who's on our board. Uh, it's a global community, as well as a lot of these folks are hands-on. Um, and so they know what's going on within the project. And their whole purpose is to govern the foundation. And then last, I want to go over uh, donors. And so we do, we 
really want to show our appreciation for donors. And so we have two pa different pages. One is for uh, corporate donors, and we do refer to them as partners, sort of informal term. And, um, and so we list them here with their logos. And we have what's called a partner program. And so if you're a corporation and you want to donate, then you can go to our partnership program. And it talks about uh, what you get for different levels of donations. And, um, and we do this because we want to um, be able to support our corporate partners too. And so we help promote what they're doing as well as providing them um, support. And support usually is uh, connecting them with the appropriate people within the project. We're talking about what's going on in the project as well as you know, what are you doing with FreeBSD? What are your pain points? What are your challenges? And understanding that. And then finally, um, going back to the donor page here, uh, we also have our individual um, and smaller corporate uh, donors listed here. And so it's really just to uh, give a shout out and recognition to these folks who are supporting our efforts. Because like what I said earlier is we are 100% funded by donations. So we really count on this. So um, I think that's um, all I'm going to cover right now. If you have questions, um, I will be attending the hallway track various times, and you can always post questions here. Actually, I do see a question. Um, and oh, actually, Anne could probably help me with this. Will the journal also be published as EPUB? And I think we are. So I'm just going to say that I think that we are doing that, and we'll make sure. Uh, Okay. Yes, we are. <laughs> I'm jumping in. Hello. <laughs> Thank you, Anne. <laughs> That's one awesome thing about these uh, virtual um, conferences. So anyway, um, I think that's it for me. And again, I uh, thank you everyone for joining. Thank you, the organization committee and, um, and the foundation too for uh, sponsoring this, this event. And Next, I'm going to hand this off to Ed so he can talk about what we're doing in our technology group. Ed's probably trying to get set up here. All right. Thanks, Deb. Uh, as Deb said, I'm going to give a bit of a whirlwind tour um, of the the roadmap that the foundation's technical staff is uh, is planning on for the next uh, uh, six months to a year. Um, I've got 15 minutes, so I'm not going to be able to go into a lot of detail, uh, but I want to give kind of a high level view of, of what we're looking at and um, offer an opportunity or uh, uh, not during this this session, um, but uh, leave a, a little trail for people to, to offer more feedback and uh, advice and such uh, in the future. So as Deb mentioned, uh, we've grown quite a bit in the technology group um, of the foundation over the last, um, well, really over the last, last year um, significantly. We've been doing funded project work within the foundation for uh, about a decade or so um, but largely speaking early on we funded individual project grants um, only and over uh, over time we've grown quite a bit to bring on internal staff uh, to take on larger and longer term projects in addition to continuing to fund um, project uh, individual grants and we've still been doing quite a few of those so when we started this year we had three full-time and two part-time uh, staff members, and as Deb mentioned, we've brought on quite a few new people uh, who've uh, who have started or um, are uh, are starting now to to ramp up what uh, what sort of work we can uh, we can do. So here's a, a view, high level view of the themes, uh, the, the high level themes that we've identified for focus uh, of the foundation's um, internal staff. 
and we get the, the feedback on what's important for us to take on from talking to companies who are using FreeBSD, from discussions with the core team, uh, from feedback from conferences such as uh, you know, BSD CAN um, uh, and the Developer Summit. Um, in person when we've run it, um, we, we typically host a, uh, the project hosts a, a 11, 12, 13 uh, planning session and uh, we have one coming up in this, this summit later on and we collect information from those sorts of things um, to identify areas of, of interest. And one of the criteria that we use, uh, we use for determining what we're going to take on is that largely speaking, we want to try and fill in the gaps that aren't being addressed within the broader community or the downstream world. Um, so when we find areas that are not being addressed um, and are a good match to our staff capability, uh, those, those are the sorts of things we want to take on. So these are the, the four broad themes that we're focusing on at the moment, uh, commodity server, desktop and end user, toolkit and appliance, and containerization. So broadly speaking, uh, commodity server, we're talking about a few different items in here and I'll get uh, go through them uh, individually briefly. The darker green ones are items that are uh, committed or in progress and the lighter green um, are somewhat more speculative or under investigation. So tier one CPU support, uh, something that we put a lot of ongoing operational effort into. So this is just general bug fixes, performance improvements, um, uh, support for new uh, features and instructions in architecture um, across tier one C, uh, CPU. So historically that was x86 improvements um, and I'll get to ARM in just a second, uh, but also we, we've been putting a lot of work into security um, from foundation uh, staff members. So uh, Mark and myself have spent a, a bunch of effort um, funded by the foundation on uh, fixes for security advisories um, and, and helping the, um, the security team. Uh, so you know, we have um, the community, uh, FreeSD community puts a lot of effort into the security team. Gordon and Philip um, do a lot of work um, making sure that advisories get out and are triaged appropriately and whatnot. And then uh, Mark and I have also spent a lot of effort uh, addressing security advisories, um, the pre preparing patches and such. Um, and we've done work on proactive vulnerability mitigations and uh, Mark under the foundation uh, has also done quite a lot of work on syscaller uh, coverage guided, kernel, kernel co code coverage guided fuzzing um, to identify bugs in the kernel and, and address them. And that will continue. Uh, next item is ARM64 as tier one. So this is something that uh, has been sort of growing in importance for quite a while. Um, Andy Turner started the FreeBSD porting effort um, almost uh, almost ten years ago or so um, in mid uh, 20, 2015, 2016, um, The foundation funded Andy and. Uh, Semi half with support from Cavium and ARM uh, to really kind of bolster the effort on ARM64 FreeBSD. Um, the, the little timeline here, the ThunderX, Cavium ThunderX uh, CPU on the left there from 2016, that was our first reference platform for FreeBSD ARM64. Um, and then uh, the Ampere EMAG is the next one on the list there. Um, we have a number of EMAG systems now in the FreeBSD cluster that act as um, build uh, package build services our primary use right now, but um, we have a number of systems um, in our production, uh, in a production capacity as uh, ARM64, for FreeBSD ARM64 now. Um, the next one is the um, uh, AWS, uh, the, the actual CPU behind the AWS uh, Graviton instances. And then um, as I think folks are aware, Apple, um, is using uh, their own ARM CPU in current generation uh, laptops and um, uh, desktops. So um, I think really what I want to just demonstrate here is that there's been a, a, a very large and increasing um, uh, level of support in the overall ARM ecosystem. And um, this year uh, with FreeBSD 13, the 
FreeBSD core team has de declared that ARM64 will be a tier one architecture in, in FreeBSD. So this means that uh, there's a number of tier one guarantees that we make for, um, uh, for architectures that are tier one. Uh, we have security, uh, FreeBSD update for security advisories. We provide uh, binary, binary objects, uh, binary installation, uh, binary packages, um, installer images and such. Um, but some of the other things that the foundation is specifically going to look at for supporting ARM64 as tier one is things like language run, uh, runtime. So making sure that languages of, of interest uh, work well on ARM64 um, and, and then ex extending out developer tools, um, supporting ARM64 specific uh, ISA extensions, um, and just sort of general usability and functionality of the platform, making sure that uh, it's, it's sort of, effectively we want it to just work. Uh, next item on the list, um, we've got uh, CI and release artifacts. So uh, Lee Wen, who works for the foundation, uh, does much of the work for FreeBSD's own self-hosted uh, CI. We're looking at both FreeBSD and third-party hosted CI for FreeBSD itself. Um, so the third party, by third party, I mean things like Cirrus CI, um, which allows us to build and test uh, FreeBSD um, using uh, uh, SAAS CI services, but also looking at bolstering uh, CI support for third party projects. So things like LLVM, for example, making sure that we have a full, a full set of, of CI runners for FreeBSD for those, those third-party platforms to make sure that things continue to work well. And we wanna make sure that anything we produce uh, under this is available and usable by downstreams who wanna set up their own uh, CI infrastructure. Uh, very brief item here on VM scalability. We've been looking at potentially continuing some work um, on SMR that Jeff Roberson started last year. Uh, Next item, uh, end user, so desktop and laptop focused. Um, we've, we funded last year uh, Emmanuel Vidot who work on the DRM uh, graphics stack and we'll take another look at more DRM work potentially in the future. Um, but right now Bjorn, uh, Bjorn Zeep has continued working on Wi-Fi, um, bringing the IWL drivers, um, uh, bringing up IWL, so a, a port of the BSD license driver or dual license driver that's in the Linux uh, in the Linux kernel to uh, to use the Linux KPI there and run it um, run it on for BSD. Uh, so let me just go to this one. Um, so basically, yes, bringing um, uh, support for newer Intel Wi-Fi chips uh, to FreeBSD via the dual license driver from Linux, um, as well using the same approach for some other uh, drivers, other devices that are supported by dual licensed Linux drivers. Um, and then just continuing um, continuing on uh, fleshing out 802.11 AC and later, uh, and we're investigating um, work on uh, additional parts of the Wi-Fi stack. Um, for the graphic stack, uh, we're investigating supporting um, additional work, uh, if, if necessary, on um, moving forward to later Linux uh, LTS releases. Uh, again, using the same Linux KPI approach that's been used in the past. Um, Thunderbolt 3 and USB 4, uh, we had some potential community, uh, some uh, work in progress from the FreeBSD community, um, but it's unclear at this point uh, if this will come to fruition or not. So this might become a, an RFP. Um, we definitely need, uh, we're going to need uh, support for, for these um, moving forward. And for uh, ports and packages um, under the, the end user focusing focused uh, effort, um, we're evaluating supporting package base um, and seeing what we can do to help uh, bring it to, uh, to a fully supported uh, state. And then finally, um, I have a co-op student working for me this term who's doing a bit of an uh, investigation and prototyping um, with potential uh, uh, new avenues for the, the FreeBSD 
installer. We've, uh, we've done some work on the debugger uh, and expect to do additional work on um, debugging and later performance tooling. Um, and so the debugger, uh, more at systems we funded to do uh, ARM64 support and a, a number of general, um, uh, general user land improvements. Um, and with Clang LLVM 10, uh, LLDB is in pretty good shape on FreeBSD. Um, the one really large outstanding item is that we don't have kernel debugging support in LLDB yet. And so we're, we're working on um, evaluating, adding, uh, adding that. And then we'll look at performance, uh, performance tooling uh, uh, shortly after this. And then finally, um, as far as uh, uh, containers, uh, containerization has been identified as an important uh, item to look at. So um, the foundation is, is spending some effort on uh, researching and um, looking at some uh, proof of concepts and, and such um, right now to see what, uh, what we can contribute to that. to containerization on FreeBSD. And I think that's sort of um, the amount of, of time I have. So what I would like to, to do is, is um, have people think about these sorts of things and uh, provide feedback directly to me or uh, via the core team or in the FreeBSD um, sessions that we, or the, the uh, release sessions that we host. Um, uh, that are, are part of the, the summits um, and help uh, identify areas that need to be added to this list that are um, gaps gaps in the in the development road uh, general development ecosystem that the foundation should help fill in or items that are on this list right now that um, that folks think are uh, perhaps not as um, as high priority as they should be, uh, or are too high priority, that sort of thing. Um, but uh, with that, uh, thanks for, for listening. So thanks, Ed and Deb. Uh, so for now, we're going to have our first break for the day, and we'll be back in about 10 minutes or so. And our next talk is going to be Warner Losh talking about his project called Camcorder. So we'll see you in about 10 minutes.
Oh, what a forum. That's new from last time. Hi, right, welcome back, everyone, from our first break. Our next talk is going to be Warner Losh talking about camcorder. And while Warner gets set up, um, just a couple of things. One is that I believe this year we're up to 240 folks who have registered on Eventbrite, or 243. For reference, when I was last tracking um, attendance at BSD Cam Dev Summits in person, I think the highest one I had recorded for 2015 was 138 folks. So um, y'all are all showing up. And I know we have some pretty active chat going on. Um, I've seen a lot of conversation on YouTube and on the Slack RC channel. You know, guys are really busy. And also on the hallway track. I joined my hallway track. Well, I'm on it, but I was active in it during the break. And uh, they're they're rather busy talking about all sorts of things over there. So um, if you want to just hang out and talk with some folks, uh, you can always feel free to bounce over the hallway track. But for now, I'm going to turn over to Warner, who's going to be talking about camcorder. Hey, thanks, John. Let me share my screen here. Okay, so I'm going to talk today about something that I've been doing uh, for Netflix uh, called Camcorder. And this is a system to uh, monitor and record uh, different um, CCBs at runtime. And, and I'll get into what that is here in a second. Um, so, CAM is the common access method. It's a set of routines and procedures that uh, Justin Gibbs and Ken Mary and Scott Long and a bunch of other people have implemented over the years. Uh, it was originally defined by ANSI, uh, but we wound up being one of the only people to implement it. Um, it's the block storage layer that most of the people, uh, most of the <clears throat> storage that we have in FreeBSD uses. And it has a message passing model. Um, and there are two uh, partners in this message passing. The hardware and translates um, protocol requests like read this disk block or um, trim these disk blocks or whatever into um, something that the hardware can do. Um, it gets its messages uh, via CCB, which are called CAM control blocks. Um, it gets its messages <clears throat> from the proof drivers. And the proof drivers uh, are block storage devices that uh, interface to the FreeBSD block system and translate the block requests into some kind of protocol, either have it be um, uh, SD cards or uh, SATA or uh, SAS or NVMe. Um, it translates the block layer requests into those kinds of requests and hands them off to the SIM via filled in CCB. <clears throat> and the SIM, when it gets the CCB from the driver, um, will um, tell the hardware to do its thing. And when it's done, it fills in some stuff in the CCB and passes that back to the driver. Now, one of the things that FreeBSD has had for years is uh, TCP dump from like the very, very first versions of FreeBSD that would let you monitor network traffic. This is very helpful for diagnosing problems. And later, after the USB stack was rewritten uh, by Hans um, Peta, we had something called USB dump, and which was the um, which was written by someone else um, that does basically the same thing, and it hooked into the um, Berkeley the BPF system um, and treated uh, USB transactions as if they were network traffic. So you can dump those out and filter on them. But we haven't had any way to do that with CAM results un until now. Um, you could do some of this um, with Dtrace. If you wanted to uh, collect logs for short periods of time, uh, you could do that with Dtrace um, and hand them off to the vendors who's saying, what's, what's your workload look like? Um, but we weren't able to provide more details than um, to some of the simple uh, things. Um, one of the things we've had different vendors do at Netflix is they've come to our site and hooked up a, basically a, a logic or protocol analyzer. Um, usually these are made by LaCroix or some other manufacturer and they take traces with them. And a lot of their tooling are based around these traces. And it would be nice if we could provide those as well. <clears throat> 
So um, why camcorder? Why not just keep using D-Trace? Well, there were a lot of reasons that motivated me for doing this. Um, D-Trace can't be always on on all the machines in our, in our entire network, for example. Um, and you can't use D-Trace early in boot. Um, and once you get beyond, I have this little simple request. <clears throat> if you want to delve more deeply into the details of, of the requests that are going on, D-Trace um, becomes uh, much harder to use much more quickly um, than I like. Um, also, uh, while Cam is, uh, <clears throat> you know, while there's some documentation for Cam, it'd be nice to study what Cam's actually doing versus what the documentation uh, says that it's doing. Um, and so having a way to view it in real time, um, it would be helpful for that, particularly if you're trying to learn how um, devices um, or SIMs are created and the, the initial things that they do. Uh, you can look at code and you can look at documentation, but that only goes so far. Um, the other thing that motivated me to write this was that we had a bunch of really, really weird crashes um, inside a cam in our uh, fleet of teens of thousands of servers. That's as specific as they let me be. Um, and we'd have, you know, five or 10 a month where I'd get a look at the core dump uh, and go, wow, that's weird. I know that it's doing some ATA request and it's, it, it made the mistake of thinking the peripheral was still there and our internal consistency checks caught it. Great, how did we get here? <clears throat> I, despite sifting through you know, maybe a, a hundred of these different core files, I could never find how we got here. So that got me frustrated. Um, so I wanted to do something about that. I wanted to have uh, something that was always on that I could then extract the recent history uh, from uh, these core files and take a look at how did we get to where we were. Um, I also, it would, it's sometimes nice Wireshark or other visualization tools to look at the time series of events that are trims are happening in their um, relative um, frequency. Um, <clears throat> and so, uh, you know, that's also something that's useful. I wrote an IO scheduler and to be able to know whether or not um, that's uh, useful is a, a good thing. Um, and finally, I couldn't resist a good pun. Um, normally you would just call this, you know, cam PF for the cam packet filter or cam dump or something like that. But I wanted to call it camcorder. Um, you know, back in the eighties and nineties um, and two thousands, I used a camcorder like this to record um, my son's hockey games. And I thought, wow, that's a cool name. I, I, I never thought I'd be able to use a name like that. So I can't resist a good pun. Now, there may be better reasons for doing a project, but you know, sometimes out of spite is you know, a good reason. Um, so some, some features of, of Camcorder. Um, first of all, the code is 100% optional. Um, if you don't have the Camcorder kernel in the option or Camcorder option in the kernel, uh, nothing happens. You don't get any, um, <clears throat> no codes changes, nothing. So this has to be enabled. Um, we can optionally retain the last in CCBs on an ongoing basis. So for my uh, crash dump scenario, I'm able to use this to capture dumps. I've not yet deployed this on a system that has crashed though. So we're um, other than on purpose, um, so I can extract the CCBs. Um, so I know they're there, but I, I've not been able to yet to use this to debug my particular problem. Um, the other thing we can do with it is dump as view in real time. I've written a cam dump program that's similar to UCB dump, or uh, sorry, USB dump that uh, dumps the different CCBs. Right now, the printing is really primitive. It just prints the type and a, a couple of interesting fields for each type or for a couple of the types, it needs a lot of work. Um, and we can also create PCAP files with CCBs. Um, and we can um, either use those in, you know, create those in real time, or we can take one that we've captured and look at it um, after the fact. So uh, to understand where I inserted stuff, 
Um, let me show you the CAM simplified diagram. This attempts to show the CCV passing that I talked about um, earlier. And um, it's kind of a, a busy uh, diagram, but the, the key part here is that, um, sorry. Mm, I don't know what happened there. The key part here is that the perif um, sends the action to the sim. And then when the sim is done, it calls XPT done. And I was able to use that um, to uh, hook into CCB. Um, I've added uh, a tap in XPT action um, and XPT done and a couple related routines so that all of the traffic um, can be uh, there. So this adds a little bit of a shim in between the, you know, the uh, perif device uh, and the XPT devices and the SIM that basically records the packet. So it's relatively straightforward to understand. Um, and I, noticing questions are popping up, I'm going to handle the questions at the end. Um, and go back to whatever slide is relevant if necessary. Um, <clears throat> and here's the interaction with IfNet. Um, this is kind of a new thing for CAM, um, where um, when we create a SIM and camcorder is active, <clears throat> we create a CAM PF uh, for that SIM. And that's basically a clonable if, uh, IfNet instance. Um, and we have a number of routines. Um, we just create one called CAM0 but the matching device will look at all of the sims in the system to match. So you can uh, do the dumps on interface in VME zero or NPR one or whatever you want to do. Um, <clears throat> and um, this is a fairly detailed diagram I included in mostly. So when people go back and look at my slides, people can look at it. Um, I'm not going to belabor it here other than to say this uses the, the, the standard mechanisms or when we do a dump, we create a new interface and create a packet filter and download a little program, um, a Berkeley packet filter program that is used to filter the packets out and pass them back to user land. Same as you would use in any other network device, except this is a storage device. <clears throat> and this um, clonable interface um, lasts as long as the, as the SIM does. So um, when we're getting packets um, in the PF, uh, we do two things with them. Or list. And the circular list, um, we um, recycle the first one to become the last one. Um, also, if while we're growing the list, we can't allocate uh, something, we pull from the first one to the last one so we can record as many packets as possible um, so that we don't have to wait for anything. One of the things that we really don't want to do is add additional latency or sleeps to CAM that are already um, there um, or then are already there. Um, the next thing we do when we get a CCB is we um, pass it off to the Berkeley packet filter tap, and that runs the packet through the little programs that have been downloaded and returns. Now, if we haven't, if nobody's doing a cam dump, um, we don't do this at all. Um, I've not optimized the call out entirely if neither of these are enabled, um, but potentially we could do that as well in the future. Um, the other companion uh, to uh, camcorder is uh, cam dump. Cam dump uh, can be used to get data in real time or display um, data you collected previous, um, previously. Um, one of the things that I'm adding as we speak is the ability to filter by endpoints. So um, for single device uh, SIMs like an NVMe drive with one namespace, um, having uh, filtering isn't all that useful, uh, at least by endpoint. But for a uh, RAID controller uh, from
Okay, I think I'm back. Um, let me grab the screen and I will continue my presentation. It seems to have taken out my screen when I closed it. One second. Oh, come on. Okay, sorry about that. Um, I'm not sure where I dropped, so I'll, I'm just going to start over on this slide, and uh, you can ask a question if uh, the last, previous part of the last slide was cut off. Um, so, Cam, Cam Dump is a program that I wrote that goes along with Camcorder, and it allows you to get the data um, out of Cam in real time or display old dumps that you've um, collected. Um, right, I'm currently adding filtering by endpoint. And what this means is if you've got a RAID controller, like an NPR or MPS controller that has multiple um, devices attached, you can just trace one. For things like NVMe, where there's only one device typically, um, it's not a big deal. But for that, it can be you know, quite helpful if you're wanting to look at just one specific de um, device. Um, it writes the records out into a PCAP file um, or, and, or displays them on screen, just you know, like you'd expect from TCP dump. Um, in the future, I plan on adding um, some additional ways to filter by um, CCB type or maybe look inside the CCBs. That's going to be a little bit complicated. Um, and I've not, you know, that'll be in the second round of, of enhancements. Um, also, um, there are a number of ways you can add custom PCAPs to Wireshark, and I hope to do that. Um, the other thing that it does is it creates a circular buffer. Um, it's exactly what you would expect um, a circular buffer to be. Um, and the main reason I did this was, again, to piece together what happened when uh, we get a panic. And I want to look at the storage transactions um, that have been completed and freed up, but um, uh, influenced why we panicked. Uh, I talked about some of the other things um, on this slide already. Uh, <clears throat> So um, in addition, in this project, there were a number of uh, minor improvements to CAM um, that uh, I did. The biggest one is I enhanced the SIM to do SMR allocation. And what that lets us do is when we're look, when CAM dump runs, it needs to look up a, a SIM by name. And there was no way to do that prior to this. And in order to um, get the lifetimes right without doing um, uh, more the heavyweight ref counting that um, CAM does uh, normally. And also to, um, to learn how to use SMR in a fairly simple and constrained um, arrangement, I added that. Um, and I did some cleanup uh, to CAM. And I started using a new tool that Linux has been using for years called Coconut. I don't ever know how to pronounce this. I've heard it pronounced Coxisnel or Coconel. Um, and basically, it's a semantic grep that lets you look for um, different constructs in the code. And I found a couple of dodgy things in CAM that I've um, either fixed or have fixes uh, in the pipeline for. Um, so currently, the status, you know, what, what's working, what's not working. Uh, currently, I'm able to collect the CCBs. Um, and if I do a force a core dump, I can find them with um, a stupid little program that I've written. Um, <clears throat> and um, with the same stupid program I've written, I can look at the running kernel and dump um, CCBs out. Um, but it's pretty primitive. I need to work on these uh, particular uh, filters. Um, <clears throat> and I'll look at the IRC mentions here in a minute when I'm done with the presentation. Um, so uh, right now only the CCB metadata is transferred, yeah, not the data itself. So I can't find the files that are being read or written to disk or anything. I just know the raw block numbers. Um, and 
as with anything in the early stages, the formatting is terrible. Um, the dumps are, you know, it needs it needs a lot of work. Um, and finally, I need to register and define a proper PCAP type. Um, and so I could provide a PCAP format. Evidently, um, I can't um, register um, the type. So that's going to be the first thing that I do. Um, I'm also going to add display code um, to Wireshark. I, I might not do this. I've had one volunteer who might do it. And if there are other volunteers that want to help, that would be great. Um, I need to improve the filtering, like I mentioned earlier, um, so that uh, we can narrow the things down. The last thing you want to do is have a one is to crank this up on a OneDrive system and do all the filtering um, or do no filtering and get all the transactions, which will generate additional transactions. It's kind of like do it running TCP dump um, on uh, for all the packets on interface you're coming into a system over. Um, that doesn't work out too well. It would also be nice to uh, post-process the PCAP files um, to look at just the SCSI CDBs or to produce um, something in industry standard LaCroix or similar uh, format. Um, Um, the different proofs that we have in CAM and maybe into some of the CAM drivers. So this is time for questions. Um, so I'm going to uh, stop screen sharing and see if I can find the questions that have been asked so far. Um, so one of the first questions was, does Camcorder include um, the protocol decoding? Um, and currently, that was what I was talking about. It produces a human readable form if you're me right now. Um, maybe some of the other CAM folks would understand it. Um, and that will be um, improved before I uh, commit this. Um, the CCBs in the buffering. Um, so the next question is, are the CCBs in the buffering? Um, and yes, they are. The, in fact, they're not only timestamped, but a number of other bits of metadata are recorded in that. And that's one of the things that needs to be um, improved. The CCB has a pointer to a path, and that has pointers to a number of different things. And if you don't record some of the information from that, if that path goes away, you have no way to recover it later. So not only is the time recorded, um, but some additional meta information um, that is pointed to by the CCB, um, but not just the CCB itself, um, is also recorded. Um, so off topic, have I performance tested um, NDA versus uh, NVD? The only performance testing that I've done um, or that I'm aware of is stuff that we did at Netflix for bulk transfers, and they're the same. The performance is the same. I know that Alexander Kaviyev um, has, uh, um, sorry, Alexander Moten, I'm getting my Alexander's confused. Alexander Moten has done a lot of um, improvements to uh, NVMe with the NVD drive for um, clients that need, uh, or customers that need, of his that need a high transaction rate. Um, and they're still using NVD. Um, I've not looked at benchmarks for that directly. Um, so I don't know uh, how big a difference uh, that is. So even though that's a little bit off topic, um, that's um, there. Um, were there other interesting things in IRC? Or if I go to IRC and see all my mentions, I will have been calcade. Oh, you should, OK. Oh, we didn't we calcade you. Um, we, we, we did stop dinging you at some point. Well, yeah, that's um, true. Imp, are you there? Are we doing the presentation? Hello? OK. I oh, was... no, we, we figured out that actually every time we mentioned you on IRC, you dinged. <laughs> of course. It, 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 it's it, twice it, we've done this to you. Um, I it, didn't have a. And, and also, um, if I didn't blow up a laptop, I had other problems. This time, dinging and internet connection. So that's two. <laughs> Uh, that's the way it goes. I had a question for you, though. I've talked about it some on IRC. Um, I know one thing that I recall with the USB dump approach is having these fake if nets around that weren't if nets introduced some unfortunate side effects. I think we have some hacks in places, for example, to hide them from if config or to make sure that we don't like auto start DH client when they come up and things like that. Uh, and I know it's probably outside the scope of what you're doing, but it might be nice at some point to have an abstraction for BPF that isn't an if net. 
where like we can attach BPF in a way to name things that BPF attaches to that aren't necessarily an if net. But that's probably a bit more than like that's a version two thing as opposed to that's you probably a version name. three thing for me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> version two is a refinement of this, but yeah. Um, the way that uh, USB dump and CAM dump deal with that is um, we return an error for every single ioctal. So um, when uh, if config tries to list the devices, um, they don't show up. So if that's the hack you're talking about, I didn't have to hack if config to keep. Um, you know, I think we may have made it better then because at one point they did actually show up, but I think we even had show up. You can list them. And in fact, when I first started this, it's like, why aren't these listed? I, I remember the USB device and my USB devices aren't listed. And it turns out, I believe that that's because there's a um, ioctal that just says return error. There's no configuration, nothing allowed for these. Okay. Um, I agree with you that it would be nice um, to have kind of um, uh, a um, uh, an abstraction that we could use um, to do that if, because uh, one of the things the Linux world has done is they have something similar where you can um, have more events and more interesting things. And it uses an extended version of uh, BPF that um, Clang, I believe, LLV has an LLVM backend for it. And they, they download stuff like that as well. And that could potentially be um, interesting. A lot of the folks that were doing Dtrace have moved on to that. Um, If you know, we could produce format opportunity for us to leverage some of that work rather than um, reinvent it all. Okay, I think you have one more question, and then we'll probably after this go to the break because I haven't seen you in there. See, but I'll let you do this last question. Okay. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> okay. So. In the U.S., um, well, I think you need to read the question so that we have. Okay, I'm going to read the question. Um, what are the applications? How uh, would we be taking advantage of this feature? Is it for like camera systems? Well, no, no. Um, in the U.S., we had uh, video recorders and you know video cassette recorders and over the top over and you know just a video camera. Um, and the only connection with, with video cameras is the name that was slang in the US in the 80s and 90s and early 2000s for these things. They were called camcorders. Um, I suppose you could use it to trace what's going on in a camera system, but um, it, it, it's, its main purpose is just kind of a pun of cam, which is the common access method, which is uh, how we do things um, you know, with that. Um, the uh, <clears throat> applications for it are more um, if you are seeing a disk hang and you want to know what I.O. is going on, or if you are trying to debug whether or not um, trims are enabled, you can see um, and actually getting um, uh, uh, through to that. Um, and, and so that's uh, some of the applications. Um, there's a question on IRC that just popped up. Um, is it possible to just capture failures? Um, right now, no. Right now it captures everything. <clears throat> and um, to just capture failures, we'd have to capture, it might be possible. Um, but um, I hadn't thought about that until uh, you asked the question. So that's, that's something I'd have to think about. It could potentially be um, interesting, but right now we report failures um, out via DevD. We report at a, not at the CCB level, but either at the SCSI, NVMe, or ATA level. We'll report the protocol block that was sent out and the status. So do I have any more time, John, or is it time for a break? It looks like it's time for a break. It's time for a break. Um, yep. Um, I'm, gonna answer side, I'm gonna answer size question real quick. No. Yeah, go for it. Um, size question was, could this have been done using deep trace probes? And the answer is no. I don't have time to go into why, but I, earlier in the talk, uh, basically, um, you can't use it during early boot and you can't um, uh, have it be always on are the two reasons why I didn't do it with DTAs probes. So. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Warner. Um, Great.
I think we're going to go to our next break. So folks are welcome to go hang out um, in the hallway track or whatever you run to the restroom, whatever you need to do during the break. And we'll be back and yeah, we'll still do 10 minutes. So we'll be back in about 10 minutes for a working group session on IP version six led by Hiroki Sato-san.
Okay, welcome back, everyone. Uh, next up, we're going to have our <coughs> excuse me our first working group session for this summit, led by Hiroki Sato, and his session is focused on IP version six. So I'm going to turn it over to Hiroki. Okay, so just a sec to. Okay, can you hear me and you see my slides? Yes. Okay, so uh, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Hiroki Sato and let me uh, get started with my presentation first. Uh, I would like to discuss the VV6 and uh, um, as entitled on this slide, the out of box experience of the network configuration. So this is outline. So uh, first half, I will uh, I briefly explain the current uh, FreeBSD uh, IPv6 implementation uh, in terms of the configuration, because uh, we are using uh, IPv6 finally. Uh, it's uh, not rare these days, but and uh, uh, most of people are familiar uh, with the IPv4 configuration, and uh, there are uh, established way to configuration, but. Uh, for IPv6, uh, there are several deployment scenarios, uh, even for your home uh, network. And uh, it is uh, difficult to understand what is normal because uh, most of the documents about the IPv6 is um, some are historical and some are uh, old fashioned. And the uh, RFC is uh, changing uh, in terms of the uh, configuration and the best practice. So it is difficult to know the uh, what what should be and you know, what is the best one. So I do not uh, intend to, or well, I'm not going to uh, define what is best, but I will show you the typical uh, configuration scenario and uh, how the FreeBSD supports them. And uh, I want to discuss the how to improve, uh, uh, how to improve the uh, way of a way to configure the FreeBSD uh, when you want to use that VB6. Because the, uh, most of the configuration will be um, in the rc.com file, but uh, this file can be uh, very complex if uh, you configure the uh, complex network uh, configuration. And the, it, it, some part is uh, quite difficult to understand. For example, and uh, which interface will be configured in what order? So rcd uh, the, a slash net if is the script to configure the network interface, but uh, it is difficult to know when the script is invoked. In most cases, it is invoked asynchronously by uh, DLD daemon these days uh, in a uh, default configuration, but uh, it is unclear uh, to system administrator uh, about uh, how the network uh, configuration will be um, uh, a network will be configured uh, on a boot time or when you type the script manually and uh, I want to uh, I want your input the feedback about your bad experience especially uh, and not specific to the network, uh, uh, please share your experience about the configuration or frustration about the configuration. And uh, it can be as a Q&A, uh, questions uh, or uh, on the chat, or uh, I prepare the website, the HackMD URL on the bottom, uh, bottom uh, I put the URL on the bottom of the, this slide so please access this and then everyone can edit this page so please uh, share your experience and this slide is available uh, as a pdf file on the uh, url on the top of the uh, this slide so please download if you want to uh, read the pdf uh, on the on your local machine so the first half i i will uh, uh, Look into the uh, look through the IPv6 uh, configuration. The core protocol is that mature, and uh, you can use it uh, safely. And uh, uh, many services are now available 
also over IPv6. But the deployment is challenging because the uh, best practice is changing. And especially in terms of the automatic configuration mechanism, uh, there are two uh, primary uh, configuration mechanism in the IPv6. Uh, one is called the Slack uh, stateless address auto configuration, and the another is the DHCP v6. It is similar to the DHCP in the IPv4, but uh, um, quite different from the uh, IPv4, uh, DHCP v4, uh, actually. And uh, uh, these days, uh, we have to consider uh, privacy and security uh, issues, and uh, VV6 has uh, several uh, enhancement after the uh, first uh, design over uh, 20 years ago. But uh, VVC supports the part of them, and uh, VVC does not. Uh, 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 the uh, important enhancement is still missing on the VVC. And the more complex environment, uh, such as the uh, multi prefix and the uh, multiple prefix, or multi horn, the so multi interface, uh, these kind of environments are not uh, well described in the RFCs. So uh, this behavior is uh, heavily depending on the uh, implementation. So the IPv6 address uh, you can see on the slide is uh, 128 bit long, and uh, compared to the uh, IPv4, the four times long and uh, uh, digit representation. And you can use IPv6 like IPv4, uh, just uh, uh, replacing the IPv4 address with uh, this kind of long uh, IPv6 address, and uh, it works. But the configuration is not so simple. So I will show the four um, possible uh, common or popular um, configuration scenarios. Uh, I categorized into the four cases uh, listed on this slide. And I will assume the network as a uh, left hand side uh, diagram. The, you have uh, IPv6 host and you have uh, one IPv6 router on your network and another host is connected to another your a local area network, and the internet service provider has IPv6 router as a default router of your network. And uh, you can choose the, uh, of course, there are a lot of ways to uh, configure your host router, um, but uh, roughly, I think uh, they can be roughly categorized into these four. The one is the manual configuration, fully manual configuration, and the BCD is uh, somewhat automatically uh, configured, uh, automatic configuration uh, in the IPv6 protocol. And uh, SLADC stands for the stateless as a result of configuration as shown on this slide. Okay, let's go on to the uh, uh, first one. So you can configure the manual uh, uh, in, by hand by specifying the all of the addresses uh, in the rc.com for example just like the bb4 manual configuration on FreeBSD, the current implementation the knob the variable and the rc.com for ipv6 yes uh, the most important one is the ifconfig underscore interface name underscore ipv6 this is the per interface knob which indicates that you want to use the IPv6 on this interface. Without this, the most of the configuration uh, related to the IPv6 on this interface will be ignored, even if you specify it. So uh, if you put this line, the rc.d uh, scripts will configure the IPv6 uh, related uh, knobs uh, such as the uh, syscontrol the or um, other necessary uh, configuration will be performed during um, the boot script. And uh, you can put the address uh, by using the uh, INS6 prefix uh, inside the IA config variable, like uh, as shown on this slide, and uh, just uh, a long 128-bit address you can specify. And another uh, other uh, knobs uh, which specifies address uh, can be used if used also 
be used for IPv6 by using the INET6 prefix. Actually, the most of the um, address-related um, rc.com variable now accept the uh, address family prefix, even for IPv4. So uh, it is a recommended way to specify the address. So even if you uh, specify the I IPv4 address, uh, please put the INET because the uh, variable supports the uh, INET and the INET6 or uh, some service supports the Ether or uh, Link or other uh, more exotic uh, keywords uh, about the address. So by default, the IF config assumes the IP, IPv4 address, but uh, as I recommend to put explicitly. And uh, you can use the IPv6 default router and IPv6 gateway to uh, configure it if, if you want to configure an IPv6 router in addition to that. And uh, this is the IP level uh, configuration, and uh, you probably need to configure the DNS server in the resolve.conf, and you can put the IP, uh, IPv6 address uh, directly into the name server line and the resolve.conf. And the next one is the uh, Slack. Uh, this is uh, uh, most widely used uh, automatic configuration, and the IPv6 supports to use the, this uh, configuration as the default mechanism. And this is basically um, uh, the configuration mechanism uh, which depends on the IPv6 router. IPv6 router is always advertising the link information. Link information means the MTU, the maximum transfer unit, and the address prefix. Address uh, prefix means the uh, subnet to a network address and the IPv4 counterpart. So RA message and on the left hand side diagram is uh, advertising on the uh, subnet connected to the uh, IPv6 router on the ISP side. So uh, you can uh, you can receive the, this message to configure the uh, address and the default router. To use the array message to configure the IPv6 host, you can put the uh, accept the out of nav to the IF config line. This uh, this flag can be specified at any of the IF config EM line, but uh, uh, you always have to configure. Okay, you have to um, specify the or define the IF config EM0 IPv6 and the underscore IPv6 uh, line to use the IPv6. So uh, this is the most um, uh, natural way to uh, configure the accept RT, uh, RT out of flag. Uh, to put this flag, the IPv6 host, uh, the interface EM will receive the uh, RA message and to and uh, automatically configure the uh, address and the default router by kernel without interaction with the user line process. And uh, it is, this flag is a bit dangerous because uh, if the uh, uh, malformed the array message or malicious array message is uh, floating around your network, the IPv6 host um, will accept any kind of configuration uh, without checking, so uh, this flag is not enabled by default. And the DNS server information uh, is can be also automatically configured by the array message. So a uh, router can distribute the uh, DNS server's address uh, on the uh, via the array message, uh, which if the router is configured to do so. So this uh, option is um, much later, uh, appeared much later uh, RFC, so uh, some implementation does not support the DNS server, but uh, uh, clients uh, these days uh, supports the uh, DNS server. But this option 
cannot be processed by the kernel. So on FreeBSD, uh, user non daemon will uh, process the DNS server option and the update uh, resolve.conf. So in this case, the address will be configured uh, as shown on the bottom of the slide. Uh, the prefix part, the subnet network address part, will be configured by the array message and the, and the lower 64 bit. This will be generated by using the MAC address. So uh, this configuration um, configured the uh, network address only. Uh, but by using the uh, route advertisement message. So uh, uh, if you enable a Slack, that you will have the complete address on the host, and uh, you can go out from your network and reach the internet. And the C is a more more complex one, the Slack and the DCP v6. And you are wondering that oh sound is dropped. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you just fine. Oh oh one one is uh saying that he my sound is dropped. But I okay, let's let's go on. And uh, so uh, case C is the using this V6. DSCV six is not uh, similar to DHPv4, but it is not widely used because the Slack is enough to configure the uh, router-facing interface on the IPv6 host. As I explained, RA message is distributed in a periodic manner from the router, so host can receive the RA message to configure the uh, network uh, information on the host, including a DNS server. So the oh, SCPv6, in this case, uh, how to, uh, so how the DHCPv6 act as the automatic configuration in this case. DHCPv6 is yes, um, a way to distribute the options, I mean the network information for uh, to configure the host or router. This is the same as my DCP4, and it includes the address. But the in the IPv6 case, the DCPv6 is designed to uh, invoke by after the after receiving the array message. I mean the so this array message has all of the information about your link. And it includes the information about uh, whether DHCP v6 should be used or not. So RA message has a, a, a option which indicates that this network uses the DHCP v6. So I, uh, uh, ideal behavior, uh, intended behavior of the IPv6 host is first receive the array message and check the bit about the DHCPv6. If it is enabled, the DHCPv6 client should be invoked. It's on FreeBSD, this behavior is also uh, handled by the RC, so uh, RT sold uh, This is used, also used for DNS uh, information to get the uh, identity information, the array message. But uh, in this case, the uh, DCPv6 uh, bit will uh, activate the um, shell script. The, this slide shows the RTSOLD flag variable in the middle of the slide, and the DCP.sh is a uh, script which will be invoked if the array message has the information about the DCPv6. You have to install the DCPv6 client and uh, uh, you have to write uh, this script, but uh, this IPv6 client is not a daemon which should be in invoked or run by the RCD script at boot time. So um, this is the design, the behavior, and uh, uh, how the FreeBSD uh, supports the uh, this. Uh, 
now DHCP v6 invocation. And uh, DHCP v6 has a uh, configure uh, capability to configure the IPv6 router. This is called the DCV V6 PD, the prefix delegation. So on the left hand side diagram shows the uh, how the address will be configured. One arrow is from the DCV V6 server is host and one, another arrow will uh, go to the IPv6 router. Uh, the IPv6, on the IPv6 router, the uh, internal network prefix, internal network address can be configured by using a DHCP. This is a popular way to use a DHCP to configure the, your IPv6 router. It is not so common to use the DHCP for um, host uh, configuration of the host. So another complex one is the PPPoE. The PPPoE is uh, widely used for the IPv4 uh, network, uh, so an internet service provider provides the IPv4 reachability over the internet connection. Uh, in this case, the Slack cannot be used. So instead, the P uh, IPv6 CP, uh, it is um, um, a part of the PPPoE protocol, and which can distribute the address information. And uh, after receiving the address information, the um, your IPv6 node will work as the Ethernet PPPoE tunnel endpoint. So it must act as a router and uh, uh, you can run the uh, DHCP v6 to get the another information. So the details are complex, but uh, uh, these four are uh, I believe these four are popular uh, way to configure the IPv6 and uh, uh, my investigation over years uh, to about the use case of the IPv6 and the current RCD and uh, so case D is not uh, supported by the RCD uh, directly, but uh, um, most of this configuration can be supported by the current RCD script and the I uh, part of them, I, I designed them to work with uh, these one. So questions is that uh, if you have any other configuration we so FreeBSD supports and uh, easier configuration, um, a, not so easy to configure on FreeBSD. If you have a, such a uh, configuration scenario. Uh, other than these four, the please uh, 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 please let me know or share your experience. Or uh, you try to configure the uh, these four, uh, one of the these four, and uh, it as uh, you have uh, experience and not uh, not experience about uh, uh, something you did not work, you did not make it work. So. Uh, that is uh, important information that the police share the experience. And uh, another configuration uh, we have to uh, consider recently is uh, IPv6 router uh, configuration, but uh, which have to support the Slack at the same time. Current FreeBSD implementation does not support the receiving array I mean that I mean that the Slack supporting support uh, Slack, and uh, uh, I explained it requires the accept or the add flag on the interface. But uh, if the uh, FreeBSD machine uh, enables the packet forwarding, the receiving array will be uh, disabled automatically. Uh, this is uh, a limitation of the, uh, the, the RFC says the router nodes should not, uh, must not, I think, uh, receive the uh, router advertisement. So implementation is, uh, uh, implementation is along with the uh, description of the RFC. But uh, this limitation uh, causes the, uh, uh, this implementation makes it 
impossible to realize the uh, slack and the uh, routing capability. And uh, this combination is uh, commonly used for uh, uh, routers used as a boundary uh, between the uh, ISP and uh, your local area network. So uh, one facing interface will be configured by router development and the uh, uh, local area network facing interface will be DCP V6PD. In this case, uh, you need uh, both uh, mechanisms. And to support this, um, Cisco will it was implemented. But uh, it is uh, a kind of a hack. So I I want to know how much uh, this knob is actually used. And the DCP based client base. I think uh, this will be the long discussion if we uh, kick off the dis this discussion. But the, I personally want uh, this VBC client and base, and uh, it should be a very small one. Because the, I explained in the earlier slide that the ECPv6 is not independent from the uh, uh, other configuration and other user line the utility which uses RA message. Currently, FreeBSD has the RT SOD as a user line daemon. Uh, which uses array, but uh, if the DHCP client will be imported, the DHCP client sh uh, should uh, read the uh, router advertised message on the interface. So if uh, two daemons will not uh, communicate with each other, um, it is difficult to configure. So um, I think it, it is a one way to import uh, the HTTP basic client. Yes, to import a very small basic uh, implementation in the base, and we maintain it directly. And if uh, for power users and uh, other experienced system administrators who want to install the uh, more feature rich implementation, um, people can install the, it from the points collection without interference with the uh, stock version of the small DHCP based client. This is not a decision. Uh, uh, I want to discuss this, but uh, this is uh, my personal um, opinion. And uh, this is the last uh, slide uh, about uh, explaining uh, issues and missing a feature. Um, this is a random list uh, which I uh, wrote, but the uh, uh, IPv6 works in most cases, but uh, there are a lot of glitches and uh, uh, missing features. And uh, uh, this is, um, I, am, I fix, I have uh, uh, implementation to fix them, or I'm still wondering how to solve uh, these problems. So first one, the link local address. And uh, first, as command line is uh, not strictly related to the um, uh, um, problem. So this is not a problem. This works fine. But uh, uh, for example, the FF02 uh, colon colon one is uh, a very popular address, uh, which uh, the every system administrator uh, is, must know and uh, very useful. But uh, these addresses are not so well documented. And the second one, the third one, the fourth one, the fifth one, the screen is uh, an example of the, of the configuration by using a link local address. If you have a server on the same link, you can configure the um, uh, server address by using a link local address. So for resolve.com, for NTP server, for um, default router, or syslogd, or exports, and the configuration is slightly different syntax, and it is very confusing, but uh, some of them doesn't work. Because of the uh, bag in the program, or the, because of the um, um, yeah, structure, or structural problem of the uh, utility or daemon, some of them are fixed, but uh, some of them are uh, still uh, uh, still, still do not work. 
And the second one is any cast address. Any cast address is the hidden feature of the IPv6 and not widely used, but the, it is a very uh, useful way to uh, provide the uh, redundant uh, root of the uh, IPv6 router. So uh, I usually put the FE80 and the, uh, the remaining bit is zero. Uh, the this address as uh, any cast address on the every uh, interface to use the um, a useful uh, way to provide the uh, uh, various kind of uh, service or a so routing uh, port to provide the redundancy. But the recent RFC uh, revised RFC. Uh, change the semantics of the any cast. So L3 communication is now allowed, but the FreeBSD does not allow the L3 communication. So we may change the, our implementation or not. Uh, we have to consider. And the privacy extensions, the every automatic configuration configured address has the a part of the uh, MAC address. So this is this causes the privacy. Uh, problem because uh, this address is a link local, but uh, this address will be used as uh, also as a global unicast address. So your address will be disclosed, just uh, uh, establish a TCP connection. So a recent RFCs um, suggest to implement a stable address. Uh, it is randomized, but you can use the same address uh, over the multiple uh, reboot. So I have a uh, uh, implementation, and uh, I am going to uh, commit the support of the stable address and the kernel. And the multicast DNS is uh, in the base system is another discussion because the uh, link local address cannot be registered, cannot be put into the DNS. So you have to use the address itself. But the multicast DNS is um, a way to solve that. But we do not have the implementation on in the base system. This is the one of the um, uh, point we can improve. OK, so that's all uh, what I have. And uh, I want to discuss, and I want your bad experience especially. That's all. Thanks. So there are a couple of questions um, uh, asking um, asking about the differences between IPv4 and IPv6. I don't know if we want to if you wanted to talk about that now. Um, oh, it, it's a big, big question. It's a very big question, so, unfortunately. Yeah. Main difference, the yeah. So of course, the address, the uh, um, so address is uh, different from the 32 bit to 128 bit. It is a, a main difference, I think. And uh, another question is, oh, okay, this Q&A has the same question. So Constantine has a question. He says, can we have something pre-canned to ease or make configuration over tunnels easier? For instance, a lot of people get IPv6 over Hurricane Electric or some similar broker. Uh, yes, I think it is a good idea. Uh, but uh, probably providing the configuration file set by using the ports collection might be the best way to provide this kind of configuration. I think the uh, DCPv6 example is uh, available as a, a, a package uh, under the net, I think, to provide the example of the configuration. Yes, I, I think it is a good idea to provide the configuration example. For, for the tunnels. 
Okay, I know for Hurricane Electric, when I used the tunnel there, um, they were actually pretty good that they had FreeBSD specific instructions. You can pretty much copy and paste into either rc.conf or to run, but I don't know that all tunnel brokers provide that same type of type of thing. So maybe a, a good example. Um, if, for example, I don't know if we've documented that in the handbook. That might be something we, that we should add. Yep. And uh, we, we definitely need uh, more documentation about the BB6. So I will put the information on my slides and the other materials into the documentation. Uh, I think it's separate from the handbook, uh, the FreeBSD on, uh, IPv6 on FreeBSD or something into the official uh, documentation set. Okay, I think that covers one of our other questions, which is, is there some documentation on using GCP v6 with PD on FreeBSD? So it sounds uh, like documentation. I think uh, server side is not specific to FreeBSD. Uh, just uh, providing the address information over the uh, DSV protocol. So I think the documentation is just uh, for the DHCP implementation itself. And uh, it uh, dependency of the uh, operating system is uh, quite small, I think. Okay. Um, I think schedule wise, we're actually due for a break. Um, so I think we might go ahead and do that. But I, there is some activity on um, folks have been typing stuff into the, the HackMD. So I would encourage folks to continue adding notes to the HackMD. Somebody had a question that renaming of an if name doesn't work correctly. And then someone has said, what doesn't work? So that one might need some more detail. But I would encourage folks to continue typing stuff into the HackMD. Um, and if you want to talk about it more, maybe grab a breakout room over in the hallway track, and we can continue discussing this in the hallway track. Um, but for now, why don't we go ahead and take a five-minute break before our next session. And thank you very much, Hiroki. Okay. Thank you, everyone.
Hello, everyone, and welcome back. Welcome back from our break. Uh, we're going to get ready and started for our next session. So next up, uh, we have Sai from NetApp, who's going to talk about IFLib. Uh, and um, oh, no, was during the break, I was checking on um, Nextdoor, which my, I'm sorry, it's my other laptop. I was checking on the hallway track. Sounds like y'all are continuing to talk about IPv6 things, something about using jails, trying to get deterministic IPv address, IP addresses that way. So uh, continue to have fun in the hallway track, but next up, I'm going to turn it over to Sai. So are you ready, Sai? Thanks, John. Yes, I am. Okay, thanks. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. You guys can see the screen? Yes. Okay. Hello, uh, thanks for attending this session. Uh, today, I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, my iFlip journey, and in particular, the performance problem that we ran into uh, when we adopted uh, iFlip on one of our platforms. Uh, about me, I am Sai. Uh, I am with NetApp for eight years, uh, exact eight years uh, as of this day. And uh, I'm an ONTAP NIC engineer. So uh, what are, who are we? Uh, we as NetApp are a global cloud-led uh, data-centric software company. Uh, like we have built all these uh, ecosystem of products, services, solutions uh, to basically enable our customers in our data journey. And ONTAP is the primary building block for all these products, services, and solutions. And uh, ONTAP is nothing but uh, a free BSD at heart. And so what is ONTAP? Um, this is this is a slide from our last year uh, conference uh, by my colleague uh, Mr. Alexander. Uh, he has did an excellent job explaining uh, what is on tap and how on tap fits into BSD uh, and vice versa. Uh, if anyone is interested, you might refer to the last year presentation and the YouTube link is uh, up there. Um, so in short, uh, uh, on, as an on tap, we have come long way in these three decades, uh, uh, and today we are at a stage where on tap code magic is nothing but a a few simple uh, K mods uh, in FreeBSD. So moving on, uh, the IFLIP, uh, the real piece. Um, so IFLIP, so what is an IFLIP? So IFLIP is basically a framework for all network drivers in FreeBSD uh, to move the large amount of boilerplate code across drivers into one single place. Um, what it basically does is it allows the driver to only deal with or focus on hardware interactions. And uh, there are many drivers that have been migrated to IFLIP. And of all the drivers, uh, we as a NetApp, uh, we are mostly interested on Intel 1G, 10G, and 40G drivers. And our journey has started with IFLIP uh, when we pulled the SVN change. Uh, so, and when, so when we pulled that SVN change, uh, the merge wasn't going well. Uh, and then I looked at this change and then I realized that it's a complete driver rewrite. Um, I'm having a tough time to integrate our customizations in. And with the available documentation that we had uh, uh, a year back, uh, uh, I started the core integration, but uh, I mean, I must say uh, it's a steep learning curve. Uh, there are many bookkeeping variables, state management, overlapping buffers, uh, queues on the list and many more. In short, uh, I can say IFLIP is a complete paradigm shift uh, from where how we write the drivers. Uh, and also during this exercise, I realized that uh, at that revision, when we pulled that revision, uh, we even lacked the feature parity. Uh, that, that was a big no for our uh, upcoming releases. Like It's like up until yesterday, we have a feature rich, stable working driver. And that served as well for almost uh, uh, few releases, close to six or seven releases. And uh, and today, uh, with this revision pull, we are at a stage uh, which has a basic feature set alone. And to attain the full feature parity and stability, I have to march ahead um, of our routine uh, march cycle. Like um, uh, in the previous slide that I mentioned, uh, uh, Alexander has outlined uh, 
how ONTAP does the routine free BSD merges. Uh, so that video would give you the basic uh, uh, picture. Uh, but uh, in general, uh, OS team would pull those changes. And uh, as and when there is a change, uh, if there is any needs any code integration effort, we just do it and march forward. But when I pull this change and to attain the feature parity, I basically have to jump ahead of our routine merge cycle and pull in all the future IF leap changes. And when I say feature changes, it also includes all interdependencies across modules. And also I need to pull in those dependencies. So it's basically a huge dependency tree or a graph. And uh, it was basically a nightmare. Uh, I had spent close to uh, two months to get the things working uh, or to attain at basic feature parity level. Um, so I finally got all those pieces that I think I need and we attained a decent stability. Uh, and so the next uh, thing for us is to put it through performance and see how it fares against the baseline. And most of the standard performance tests were happy, uh, but one of the performance tests that involves uh, software IWARP uh, is not happy. It sees a huge latency spike in comparison to our baseline. So we started digging into this, uh, as in why, why we are seeing a huge spike in latency. So uh, the first step, we looked into the netstat, uh, netstat output. And I see a Q and A. Uh, yes, this is all Intel iFlip. Uh, OK, uh, sorry for the divert. So yes. Uh, uh, we started looking into netstat uh, and uh, we found that the LR1 TSO sizes uh, are way smaller uh, in comparison to our baseline. So we thought maybe that is our hint and we started making changes uh, for uh, to match or exceed the LR1 TSO sizes. Uh, so at first uh, we started uh, tweaking the interpret. Uh, so IFL comes with a default uh, uh, static interpret. So we started tweaking those values. Um, and uh, there is some increment in LR size, but the latency, we did not see any, I mean, huge improvement or any considerable improvement in latency. Um, in parallel, uh, we also started talking with Intel uh, and uh, put forth the theory about the LR size. So uh, thanks to Intel, they have come forward and provided us a change that would uh, increase the LR size. Uh, the change basically does, uh, uh, it basically stops the aggressive checking of the available descriptors and instead rely on IRQs uh, to tell when to poll for the completed uh, RX descriptors. Uh, and with this change, yes, indeed, uh, we have uh, LRO size bump to 17K. And the values that you see there, uh, 16K is our baseline, 13K is our uh, IFLib baseline without Intel's change 17k is with intel's change so in fact we are 1k greater than our baseline um, there is improvement in latency uh, maybe a 1x but still uh, uh, we are nowhere close to our baseline uh, so we are thinking maybe we might as well need the tso segment size increase too um, so we started to tweak from 2k 4k to 16k um, uh, but in fact uh, uh, there is no latency improvement than we had with uh, LRO. Um, so then we so then we started looking in, um, digging in more. Uh, so the next, uh, we found that we have matched the LRO TSO sizes matched to our baseline, uh, but latency is nowhere close. Uh, so then we started looking at uh, uh, the code and the behavioral differences that we have between IFLib and non-IFLib based drivers uh, with respect to Intel, Intel drivers. Um, and we find that uh, uh, the aim, the adaptive interrupt moderation has been removed. And we also find that uh, the TX is a soft IRQ in an IFLib driver when compared to an hard IRQ uh, in the legacy or BHD11 uh, drivers. So I have started an attempt to bring back the aim, the adaptive interrupt moderation. And uh, that is still in progress uh, thanks to Mark uh, 
uh, and Kevin, we are working on these changes to pull in uh, the bring back aim into IFLE based drivers. And then uh, in parallel in my local workspace, uh, I started uh, creating a unique IRQ uh, for TX, much, much same as RX side and tie this IRQ callback uh, into an uh, G task. So whenever I get an IRQ callback, I just queue a uh, simple uh, G task. Uh, so just tie into the existing TX mechanism for IFLIP. Uh, there was no improvement uh, still. Um, so now we are um, what close to maybe six or eight months into this exercise and we still have uh, a much uh, to even catch up to our baseline. Um, and then we started looking into the basics. Uh, like we started looking at from the software IWAP perspective or from the application perspective. And we noticed that uh, the application request uh, basically take close to 10x time to complete in comparison. That is the time between the MBUF send on TX side to an MBUF free callback, we see almost close to a 10x uh, multiple uh, to get the free callback uh, reported. Uh, then we added a bunch of histograms um, at all different levels in the stack, uh, application, networking stack, and driver uh, to see what is going on. And uh, that's when we noticed that uh, TX MBUF is basically staying longer in our stack uh, in comparison to the baseline. So, but the TX path is pretty much straightforward. The application prepares a TX packet, hands over to stack, stack prepares the TS1, gives it to IFLIP to hand it over to the hardware. So if at all there is any latency that can uh, spike, it should be somewhere close to IFLIP. Uh, so I started making few changes in IFLIP with an intention to basically shorten the lifespan of MBUF within IFLIP. And uh, uh, yes, after that change, we are now a match to our baseline numbers. So this is a uh, graph that uh, after I prepared the histogram. Uh, so this is how uh, it shows up for the application. Um, so if you see the red one is after my change. So if you see that majority of MBUFs are basically getting their free callback being called within less than one millisecond. Uh, in comparison to the blue one, uh, which is prior to changes, uh, few MBUFs even drag into uh, 800 millisecond or even a second. And uh, this is how it looks at IFLIP. So in an IFLIP uh, with the change, almost all MBUFs, so this is, this is a basically a lifespan between the IF transmit getting called into IFLIP and IFLIP is enqueuing into their buffer and the exit path where it basically drains or reclaims the completed uh, TX. So this whole MBUF lifecycle span, after a change, it basically lies within 10 to 100 uh, microseconds. I mean, there are something trailing into one millisecond, but at most everything gets completed by one millisecond. Uh, in comparison to the baseline or without any change, you can see the few MBUFs even drag into a second or even uh, two seconds. I mean, I have captured uh, the numbers behind this graph in later slides. Uh, if anyone interested, we can look into them at the end of presentation. But uh, in those numbers, you can see uh, some uh, IFLIP MBUFs uh, even go till four seconds. So uh, what was my breakthrough? Uh, so the key to my breakthrough is to separate the TX MBUF reclaim processing uh, from the TX processing. When I say TX processing, it is the NCAP or the IFLIP TXQ drain. So uh, these are the changes that I made in the code to uh, gain back my baseline. Um, so first one is uh, in our fast interrupt RX TX handler, instead of just enqueuing the G task for TX, we can as well do a reclaim of TX descriptors directly. The next one is the, the standard TXQ drain path. Make it only perform the NCAP, 
which is just enqueue into the hardware queues uh, and remove the reclaim from from that gtas callback um, i mean it would be ideal to have the reclaim also retain in both the irq callback and also on the drain callback but uh, in my experiments uh, it looks like we are restricted by the uh, lockless mp ring and uh, if i have this retain in two different paths uh, the state management or the bookkeeping variables are getting uh, basically confused or screwed and uh, it results in basically a queue hang situation uh, the rx and tx would not move an inch so i have to uh, remove the or suppress the reclaim from the drain path and only enable it in uh, rx tx path the irq path um, and uh, uh, finally uh, uh, we rely on the aim the adapt interrupt moderation and basically disable the if lib soft uh, moderation uh, if you look at the if lib uh, uh, if lib has this code for uh, doorbell writes and result status array so IFL basically or deliberately uh, delays notifying the driver when it is done writing to descriptor and when it wants to read the status. So I basically disabled that one and I just relied on hardware aim, which is nothing but what we have in BHD 11. So those were the changes that went in. Uh, and in this exercise, uh, uh, these are my learnings. Um, so, I mean, it has, it's been what, like six or eight months. Um, so this is, this is what I learned in all these three exercises. Um, as much as we say that, uh, with IFLIP, we are separating the RX and TX queues, uh, but inherently, uh, they are still tied together. Um, uh, that is every TX packet on its end of packet flag, it would still trigger an IRQ. And uh, we can safely rely on this one and reclaim any done descriptors in an IRQ callback. Um, yeah, I understand uh, like doing a TX um, descriptor processing in an RX IRQ callback uh, may sound weird and not self uh, intuitive. Um, maybe we might as well create a unique TX IRQ uh, and do this IRQ processing, the TX IRQ processing alone in that uh, callback. Um, with the, the other thing is with, with the TX packet completion, uh, generating interrupts, right? Uh, we can rely on AIM uh, and let AIM, uh, which is proven till BHD 11 already, uh, let it do the moderation for you. Um, like when I'm looking at the code, like I mentioned before, uh, uh, IFLIP has chosen to ignore the interrupt moderation, the hardware interrupt moderation, and created its own version of moderation uh, where uh, it deliberately delays uh, the doorbell uh, right to the doorbell register right. Um, and also, it selectively picks which descriptor or which ID it wants to uh, read the result from. Uh, in other words, like all this has been translated into our application, waiting a bit longer for the data that is already been sent. Uh, and uh, we are taking quite in comparison a bit longer or quite a long to even complete the MBUF and send a free callback uh, to the application. Um, and um, uh, like I said before, um, we wanted the TX descriptor to be reclaimed as fast as we can in our performance run experiment. So you know, ideally we would want to retain uh, the TX descriptor to be reclaimed even on the TX path as well as an IRQ path. When I say TX path in sense, uh, whenever you submit and uh, uh, transmit uh, request, if there are complete descriptors, uh, you might as well clean it, uh, which is the standard IFLIP behavior right now. We might as well retain it. Uh, but if I retain that one, uh, we are running into a queue hung situation. Um, and I think that is because most likely uh, there is no locking mechanism within IFLIP and uh, having two threads in parallel doing a state management or bookkeeping variables change is basically confusing uh, uh, IFLIP and uh, the TX uh, path seems frozen. And uh, like said, uh, 
iflib is like an uh, i mean i can say mystery box or a pandora box um, every time i open the file to uh, look into the code i learn in a new one a new thing um, and uh, uh, i must say the special thanks to uh, my teammates frank and john uh, who have been with me all along um, as a team like we chased this one for almost 8 months and these guys has kept me sane for all this long and um, thanks to my performance team who stayed with me all along to run the experiments give me the pictorial representation of what's happening uh, and help me guide in the right path uh, and as well uh, thanks to mark mark johnston um, netapp is working with mark johnston uh, uh, helping us to uh, take back some of these or few of these uh, changes back to our community uh, and i'm sure we have long way to go um so that that is it my presentation um, if you have any questions or thoughts uh, uh, here is my email and uh, like i said in the uh, meeting uh, uh, presentation before these are the numbers that uh, went beyond the graph um, so if you see uh, before change it drags into 800 milliseconds uh, and uh, basically the embuffs are basically spread across uh, uh, whereas with the change clear top heavy uh, this is how it looks at iflib um, if you see the histogram uh, the embuffs are spread all over and uh, with the change we are top heavy majority of embuffs are getting done within 800 microseconds okay so that is it for my presentation and there is a question in there is this also relevant for melanox uh, no uh, melanox has stayed away from iflip driver um, so melanox continue to be in their legacy format and looking into the chat okay i think that's it yep i've looked i don't see any other let me check youtube but i don't see any other questions cool well thank you very much si that was very interesting thanks I'm glad you're having success with working with mark to get your changes upstreamed yep, so thank you we'll continue making progress uh, that. Yeah, and I also see uh, Kevin has created a work in progress session for tomorrow for yes. iFlip. Yeah. 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 I would be attending there, and uh, if anyone uh, wants to discuss more there, we can talk in there as well. Okay. Sounds perfect. Thanks, guys. I'm going to okay. stop the share. Back to you, John. All right. Thanks. So uh, we have uh, one final break. Well, I guess we have one more break today. Um, so we have a, a break um, now for about 10 minutes. And then after that, we're going to have a presentation, a kind of a panel style presentation, perhaps. Yeah. I'm not quite sure what they're doing from the FreeBSD core team. So John, uh, there was one quick question oh, sure. uh, on IFLIP from Jan. Uh, so Jan, um, so th this is in specific to software iWork. Um, that is one of our application on one of our platforms. So this, this application is heavily used um, to basically replicate the content across clusters. And this is an RDMA protocol running on TCP stack. And uh, for this uh, application, right, for our use case, we basically replicate the content over RDMA protocol. And once the content replicates on the other side, we go on a flag, yes, we are done. So we would need a very low latency response or very low latency application. And we are not seeing that happen with iFlip. And maybe the other applications, maybe they are not such latency sensitive. But uh, I mean, I can say that the applications that we are on or we are running on, they were not latency hungry. Um, but maybe if there is any application that is latency sensitive, uh, maybe they might as well run into the same situation. Okay, John, sorry. 
Oh, no, that's fine. Happy to have questions answered. Okay, so I don't see any others. I'm going to wait another 30 seconds or so, just in case. But barring another late, late arriving question, we'll go ahead and move into our next break, and we'll be back for the core team panel after this. Thank you again, Sai. Thanks, John.
Okay, so welcome back, everyone. Our next session is actually going to be uh, a discussion led by the FreeBSD, well, a subset of folks from the FreeBSD core team. I believe George is going to start us off, but we also have um, several other folks from core available. So I'm going to turn it over to George, and then y'all can take it from here, however y'all want to run this slot. Thanks, John. Uh, in true 2021 form, can you hear me now? Uh, looks like my microphone is active. Yes, I can hear you. Can anybody hear Excellent. me? <laughs> we can hear you, Warner. Right. Yeah, actually, we can test if we can hear Warner if we go ding him on IRC. <laughs> right. Ding, no, no. ding, ding. Yep, Warner's mic's working. Okay. So, um, great. Hi, uh, welcome to the core session for the developer summit. This is definitely the weirdest core session I've ever done. And I've done a lot of core sessions and core sessions tend to be weird. But I've never had to do one from my house. Um, so uh, a few of us from the core team are gonna talk about a few things uh, relevant to the whole, to the project as a whole and to core generally. Um, but first I wanted to do the following. So, um, I don't know if you've noticed, noticed this, but uh, 2020 and 2021 were probably the most stressful years for most people who work on the project. And uh, we can tell this through various means. In particular, uh, CORE gets to see this because we get to see people who are complaining about each other to CORE, which I will not go into in depth, but I can tell you that the number of people who are a bit frazzled is fairly high. So with that in mind, here's my first, here's our first slide. Uh, we're gonna just take a moment to chill, which means I would like everyone for the next, I was gonna do this for five minutes, but I thought you might all kill me at the next in-person uh, uh, meeting. But uh, for the following minute, minute, I would like everyone to simply stare at their screen, not type and breathe. And I'm gonna time that on my little timer here. So everyone breathe in, hold your breath, breathe out. Breathe in again and breathe out. Let's do that for about a minute so that we're all nice and relaxed when we talk about the project. All right, so that's a whole minute of being relaxed. Um, let's go back to our regularly scheduled program. Um, so Warner, uh, your next two slides are up next. So let's go through the two things you wanted to add into this. Um, sure, I don't know if my video is gonna show up or not, but otherwise we can watch George. You're on mute. What? Can you- You're not on mute, I can't hear you. I'm not on mute. Can you I hear can me? I can hear you, it's fine. Yeah, we can hear okay. you, Warner. All right, so there were two updates I wanted to give about some of the work that I have in progress. One of them is um, SPDX uh, licensing update. One of the things that's been frequently requested is um, to have detached licenses. And I'm working on a policy to do that. Specifically, a detached license has a copyright and an SPDX license identifier uh, expression and nothing more. Um, and there's a couple of other ancillary um, standards. So I'm trying to write up a policy that pulls them in so that we're as compatible as we can be by doing nothing, um, <laughs> but um, we'll be uh, compatible. Um, you know, there might be a couple of small changes we need to make. This will also make it clear um, when you find a file with one of these um, changes, you know, what the license is and so forth. So expect uh, some more information about that. Um, I'm almost ready to hand off the policy to the lawyers. 
Um, if there's anybody else that would like to participate and can do so productively um, in this process, I would like you to, to invite you to call me or email me or catch me on Slack or IRC or Discord or Twitter or I don't know what else. Anyway, next slide. Next slide, George. So the next slide is about um, upstreaming uh, the QEMU uh, BSD user. Um, a number of people have been working on this. Uh, most recently, Kyle and myself, we took over from Sean Bruno, who took over from a long list of people. And th this is something that we um, use. Um, <clears throat> this is something that we use um, uh, quite extensively in the uh, in our um, package building system. So um, it's upstreaming. This is a status. It'll probably take about six months um, before we get everything upstreamed. And um, I just wanted to let people know that that was what's going on. We had a log jam for a number of years on this. And um, Kyle and I have just, just been doing that. Anyway, one thing too, BSD2 clause free BSD tag is not what you think it is. So that's gonna probably be a bit of a surprise that comes out of the SPDX stuff. I just saw a comment on IRC. Um, anyway, um, on to the next slide. I'm gonna say, tell George take over. Um, so that he can start uh, talking to the rest of the slides. Okay, now I can hear you, Warner. Okay, so you. take over for me. Can you okay. hear me now? Now I can hear you. Now this, it's your turn. Uh, <laughs> Just um, in time. <laughs> perfect. So someone should send me a ding, like just mention my name somewhere so that I know that I'm being mentioned. Um, okay. I just, uh, I just dinged you on IRC, so. There you go. Um, so, <laughs> uh, <laughs> great. Uh, God. Anyway, um, so one of the things we, uh, we core went and did was we asked a bunch of the hats and teams um, to talk about what they've been doing and in particular to try and get people to talk about what they need. Um, our greatest need will always be hands and attention on the project. Um, we need people to work on various parts of the code, but also on various things that support uh, FreeBSD as an operating system that is shipped to people and consumed by people all over the world. So um, we talked to you know RE and Cluster Atom and security uh, documentation. So I'm going to run through some slides from each of those teams, which try to talk about some of the stuff that they've done, some of which people may know, and some, people, some of which people may not know, um, and to flag wave and get people to possibly volunteer to help these teams work on the project. Um, I wanted to say a word, or we wanted to say a word about hats and teams. Um, we know that a hat is a generic term for the leader of a team, uh, also known as the person who didn't say no quickly enough when we tried to give them a hat. Uh, many, many hats are kind of forced upon people's heads. Um, teams in FreeBSD are work as affinity groups, right? So teams set their own charters within bounds. Um, I don't know that we've ever bounded someone's charter, but um, can't be completely open-ended. Um, important to note that the team chooses its own members, right? So, you know, um, just because you volunteer work on a, a team doesn't mean that that team is going to want to work with you. Um, hopefully they do. but Teams are self-selecting and they're allowed to do that. Um, Core's role in dealing with hats and teams is to bless those in whatever way you wanna think of that, um, but generally tries to avoid interfering in the inner works of the actual teams. Um, all we're interested in from the core point of view is that you know the various hats and the various teams are able to work uh, to achieve their goals and to work with the rest of the project to achieve the overall goal of building an excellent operating system. 
So release engineering, uh, when asked what could people be doing and what could people be working on uh, with RE, um, a lot of the stuff was actually requests for things that people could do while not on the project. In particular, more testing. Um, release engineering team would really like people doing a lot more dog fooding, uh, a lot more uh, testing of things like re weekly development snapshots if, if and when you can, um, especially beta NRC builds because those are right before we're about to do a release. Um, don't wait till the last minute to request a change on a release on a release engineering branch because that's going to uh, reduce the likelihood that your change will make it in. And of course, please don't break Pola. So beware of you know KBI and ABI changes on stable branches because the last thing we want to do is surprise people who are consuming a stable branch. One of the things that uh, one of the hallmarks of the quality of FreeBSD is that we have a very strong commitment to KBI and ABI stability uh, within a stable branch. So cluster administrations actually looking for a couple of people to step up and actually work within the cluster atom uh, team. They ask that people have proven system and skills and that people have done systems administration in uh, you know, large heterogeneous environments. Uh, you know, the fact that I can sysadmin my laptop and the server that you may or may not be able to see behind me does not make me a crack sysadmin. It just makes me a sysadmin of my own crack um, work. So um, need to be able to work with the group. Uh, so if people want to try and work with cluster administration and help them, you know, maintain our infrastructure, which is how we actually produce you know, our product, uh, you should get a hold of them uh, on their mailing list. They do ask that uh, we don't <laughs> we don't chuck uh, experimental hardware at them. Turns out that things like ThunderX and Early Power uh, needed so many changes that having them in a cluster where secure access was extremely important made it difficult. Those kinds of systems, they ask us to put those into test uh, clusters, which actually I'll talk about at the very end of this. Uh, and I think the last line can be interpreted in a GNN way as clean up after yourself. We're all adults, clean your room. Um, you know, please do not just leave things you've built around on the shared infrastructure that we all need to use. SEC team. So um, the SEC team, security officer team, that's the group that is responsible for doing things like security advisories and errata notices, um, produces the FreeBSD update binary uh, builds. Um, when reporting issues, they ask that um, people use the forms that have been made for this. There, it turns out there are already three templates. They're here. Um, I'll share these slides with John so they can be put somewhere publicly later on. Um, when reporting routine security issues, i.e. please do not put a zero day directly in Bugzilla because that, that's not very helpful to us, that's bad. Um, but when you do put routine security issues, uh, put them under product security in Bugzilla, uh, which limits visibility. And as you see, for particularly sensitive issues, you know, you found a zero day in FreeBSD, um, send a PGP encrypted email to the security officer. The key's in the talk repo. Uh, Satosan, are you on is the documentation one? Uh, yes. Yes. So, okay, please talk about this. Uh, let, let me explain the updates about the documentation. Um, so on documentation front, we change it a lot about the tooling, uh, especially uh, a migration to the Git report uh, along with the other uh, two repository and the migration from the XML uh, markup to the ASCII doc now and the translation team now use the web -based UI. Um, the UI. Uh, these uh, tools are now available for uh, new uh, writers of the um, exciting documentation. So uh, one of the good reputation of the FreeBSD is uh, documentation, such as the handbook and the uh, uh, ports developers has the ports handbook. Uh, we have uh, good materials, but we still need uh, good writers of uh, new documentation, especially um, we do not uh, we do not 
do a good job to collecting the questions uh, floating around the mailing list, uh, I will see in the public forums. Uh, so people can encounter the error message, uh, the uh, resolution of the uh, uh, answer can be found uh, on the official website, the Google search. But uh, so decreasing the number of users compared to the Linux. So we are losing the such information visible for the newcomers. So uh, please help about the uh, writing documents. And uh, uh, we designed the official website and uh, uh, importing the existing uh, good documents on the other side, like uh, this slide shows the freebasedwiki.net. This uh, site has a good set of documentation, but uh, our main internet is no longer actively uh, working on that. So uh, these information, if we can accept as the official documentation, we want to do. So yes, uh, one thing we want to focus on after migration and tooling is uh, to write uh, more documents uh, as well as uh, a, a lot of core, good code for the base system. Okay, that's all. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> hmm. I wonder if anyone can guess who submitted this slide. Uh, so it turns out nobody, <laughs> the project hates Jenkins more than Lewin. Um, because you know, the closer you are to the knives, the more you get cut. Um, um, yeah, I, I actually typed this slide in from uh, Lee Wynn's uh, um, material that he provided me. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, in the in the CI system, we now have supported branches and architectures with builds and tests. Um, the tests are you can find you can find them under user tests. Thanks to Traz. Uh, there are new test jobs coming for TCP test suite and GCC nine. Um, and the uh, one asks that people follow the VCS migration to track source and doc changes with, with Git, because now all of the CI stuff is obviously going from our Git repos, um, you know, except for, I believe we're still doing stable 12 from SVN. Kubes asks for some help um, on uh, improving our SEO. So one of the things that actually uh, Satasan alluded to this is earlier as well is um, people being able to find things out about FreeBSD. And of course, the, <clears throat> you know, other than DuckDuckGo, the place where people go to look for answers to questions, um, you know, is usually Google, which is going to point them at something. And so uh, the project needs to improve its uh, search engine optimization so that users and other people, you know, users of FreeBSD can find answers more quickly, easily, and they show up at the top of the search results. Um, you can email Kubes to help out with that. Okay, and then this is the, the nearly last slide. So um, for those who don't know, which I think would be surprisingly few, um, for over a decade, I've helped to maintain a network test lab, um, which is hosted by some very kind people up at Centex in Canada, uh, Mike Tan Tanksa and Paul Holes, who I spelled his name incorrect. I had it in the end. Um, Mike's the CEO. Uh, they use FreeBSD. He's been incredibly generous and helpful um, with helping us to host a test lab full of very expensive, um, high-performance networking equipment. So. Um, I'm looking for one or two uh, shepherds, as I like to call them, um, to help reduce the bus factor, because if I get hit by a bus, it would be very bad, um, at least for the network test lab. For me, it would solve a lot of problems. Um, so what are the responsibilities? It's actually fairly simple. So most of the, I mean, all of the day-to-day -day work, the hands-on work is done by Mike and Paul. Um, they're extremely responsive to email. They're occasionally on IRC. I keep trying to get them to come to a BSD event in person so I can shower them with beer. Um, and so, you know, day-to-day -day operations are mostly handled by them. Um, there is a bit of outbound, um, like uh, as the monks do, going with a begging bowl. So um, the reason we have all of the hardware in that test lab is because 
uh, we've asked for it. So when Chelsea makes a new card or Mellanox makes a new card or Solar Filler makes a new card or someone makes a new switch, um, you know, when we needed a hundred gig switch, I asked Mellanox for one and they strangely said yes. Um, so it's keeping track of who's doing what new devices that FreeBSD should operate on and trying to get those people to send us hardware, um, usually two cards, uh, so that we can do things like back-to-back -back testing. And there's a little bit of internal work. We actually control the accounts on the build server. Uh, nothing is controlled by Cluster Atom because that way we can not pollute the uh, general FreeBSD namespace. Also, it allows us to have outside collaborators. So there are people who've worked on the network, worked within the network Tesla um, who are not FreeBSD committers. They don't have a commitment and therefore they don't have a FreeBSD.org email. So that's been easier. Uh, and then a bit of periodic ma maintenance on the main build server, Zoo. Um, it'd be really nice to add some automation to the lab. That's something that I haven't done. Um, it's complicated as everything is in networking. But if someone has an interest in trying to at least automate the reservation system, which is currently go edit the wiki and make sure you don't step on other people's toes, um, that would be super helpful. And if you want to help out with the network test lab, just email me at tnn at freebsd.org or wherever else. Um, and so that is the end of the slides. So let's go back to everyone else. Stop share. And we have what, 12, how long do we have left? 12 minutes? So I don't see any questions in the Q&A, but if people want to ask questions of CORE generally, they should do that. Looking at the schedule, George, I think we actually have uh, 40 minutes or so. Is that right, John? Yes, it is. I don't, I don't, I don't want 40 minutes of questions. No. OK, so we have quite a, quite a bit of time for questions. So if people have questions, they should, um, I guess, put them into the Q&A. Yeah, we can also watch on like YouTube or Slack and Discord and whatnot for what folks say. We do have a few other um, sessions for core related things uh, throughout the summit, uh, including some discussion of potential workflow improvements. And I think we don't, we don't really want to start covering that um, now. Uh, although if folks have any specific questions, I suppose they can, uh, they can bring them up or if there's anything they'd like to prime for, for that discussion. I'm just looking at the YouTube to see if there's questions over there. Um, so I'll ask a question. Hopefully it's not too redundant with what you talked about earlier. Um, you have a year left in your current term. Do you all have like a top three to-do list of things, issues you want to work on um, during the remainder of your current term? I think that's a, uh, a good question, um, John. I think uh, it's probably a good point, um, if nothing else, yeah, to to look at what we what this core team set out to do at the beginning of um, its uh, tenure and uh, what we hope we can still accomplish during the um, uh, the rest of uh, of the term um, I don't know if anyone else wants to start off first uh, oh no you picked it up it's your baby now <laughs> so I mean, for reference, I will say last core team, we had a couple of times where we kind of had to do that and evaluate mm -hmm. what our priorities were because our, our to-do list kept growing, but it was about, uh, we have so many, you know, so much time and resources we can devote. So what were the things we really wanted to do and we'll just punt on the other things because we can only get so much time. Right. And I think uh, one of the main 
topics that was handed uh, or the main tasks that was handed off to this current core team from the previous core team uh, was the Git uh, transition. And that certainly took longer and perhaps more effort than we um, we'd expected. Um, we thought maybe that it would um, it would it would be complete in the early part of this course team, this core team's tenure, as opposed to about halfway through um, or uh, a little before halfway through. Less than halfway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but still, I mean, I think um, that was probably the main um, technical aspect we this core had a mandate to take on and and has been wrapped up now um, through efforts of both core members and uh, in particular Lee Wen uh, putting a lot of effort into to picking up the pieces on that. I think that's that's the main thing we we wanted to accomplish. Um, and I think there are a bunch of workflow improvements that we still hope to um, to get out of the, the Git transition or be able to build upon the Git transition. Um, and those are, you know, we're discussing those uh, later on in this summit, um, some ideas and uh, yeah, things we're going to do. I have, a, I have a whole presentation on that. I would state the goal more succinctly. I hope that we as a community, not just developers, not just users, but as a community, we can find a way and a uh, framework to move forward on integrating a lot of the promise that Git has for reducing friction in our process, for making us more efficient, to, uh, as well as um, helping us to grow community by being more responsive because we can be more efficient. And there are tooling issues and there are people issues with both of these. We've had a 20 year long track record of not landing patches. That's not gonna be fixed by a tool, but a tool can help fix that. Um, but if we don't fix our process, we're not going to fix that. And that's a large part of what my talk is going to be about tomorrow. So that's, that's the one thing. It's not that we're going to have it solved because we're never going to have our workflow solved. We're always going to need to be re revising and refining and figuring out what to do next. Um, and if we don't have a framework for talking about that and talking about that productively, we're going to continue to flounder. And that's one of the things I learned from the Git transition was that we need to have a good framework for doing things. People need to be productive and we need oversight for when they're not. Um, not because you know we want to scold them and they're bad, but we need to get things rolling again or we need to hand off to other people or whatnot. We need to build redundancy into some of the key aspects of the core of the um, project. And we lack that redundancy now. So that's, that's kind of what I'm hoping to um, set up um, in the future. I just have... thank you, Wendy. Um, Where's do... my lunch? <laughs> I was say, did I you order one in advance? What's going on here? Did you order one in advance? I ordered one in advance. So, um, so the other thing um, that I'm hoping to get done is what we talked about a little bit earlier is I want to get the SPDX stuff. That's a very bounded, simple thing. It's just gonna be a policy um, that we've got vetted through some legal folk and that um, anybody who is looking at a file will know what that means. And that's really from a legal perspective, um, all you need. It doesn't have to have all the T I's crossed and T's dotted because the law isn't code. And um, that's been the biggest thing I've learned from looking at the SPDX stuff. Um, to answer one of the questions that was on IRC earlier about that, SPDX has kind of a fuzzy match. So we're never gonna have an exact thing, but the fuzziness is okay because all the fuzzy things that match the same thing are legally the same thing in terms of um, you know what your obligations are, your rights are, and what you would litigate against. Um, so, and that opinion has been validated by a large number of lawyers uh, in the real world, uh, so. That's the other thing I'm hoping to accomplish um, in this term. Um, so that's it. I mean, the first goal is pretty big and ambitious and I'll need everybody's help. And the second goal is more manageable. And if you know, there's a couple of people that can help me on that, that'd be great. And if not, I'll still get it done. Is that the sun?
Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. So I um I have a, a slightly different ideas uh, from the other core members because the, my uh, ideas when I run for the core team, though so I am a probably a, um, a core team member who has a long history on the uh, um, uh, terms, uh, so past terms and the current terms. But the, I only think the core must be um, um, encouraging the uh, um, uh, com developer community uh, rather than the actively uh, working on the uh, leadership work. So the first term is the the core is small, and the current term is uh, more actively working on the, uh, for example, the get get um, transition from the uh, subversion or uh, something like that. So I think um, the current core team is uh, doing a good job and uh, I, uh, I'm i happy with uh, working with the current core members. But uh, another thing uh, we do not, we should not forget is um, uh, we should uh, maintain the uh, people already working on the various teams in the uh, Freebase project, the if they have uh, trouble, um, the uh, if the the mm, teams or other uh, sections or inside the Freebase project, uh, that's uh, what we have to uh, maintain. And uh, more people, uh, we have to put the more active people inside the structured. Um, work inside the uh, project because we are um, a volunteer based work. So uh, we love a lot of active people, but uh, uh, one of the important tasks for the core team is organize them and encourage them. So yes, uh, the taking a leadership is a one. Uh, I am not good at uh, speaking out the uh, a lot of things to the uh, people, but uh, yes, I am uh, seeing the people and the where uh, where the problem uh, is uh, for a long time, and uh, I want to spend the time to uh, oversee the uh, that kind of problem as a, a member of the coaching member. So yeah, that's the uh, current view of the uh, coaching and the. Uh, one of the uh, tasks is uh, the current, current core team uh, should consider, and uh, I can uh, help where I can help. So I'll go. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, I mean, I was going to say that I wanted to get to the end of the next year and just survive, but I guess that's probably a little too dark. Um, you know, the, the things that I uh came on core to do are things that i am still you know they're not things that'll get done in two years so um i really want to see us as a project um do more to uh make freebsd usable as a toolkit for building more things um we've done that pretty well and that's why a lot of uh, vendors have picked up freebsd and built things with it i mean netapp and Isilon and Juniper and many people have, have used it to build products. Um, you know, a, a monolithic Unix-like operating system with a 40-something year history, if we go all the way back to BSD, is an interesting artifact. But is it the right artifact, you know, going forwards? Like, how do we make it so that our software can wind up being part of systems that are now called IoT, which used to just be called embedded systems, but since everything needs a tag phrase, now it's called IoT. Um, so figuring out how to how to you know work, how the project can improve the architecture of the system overall, not just package based, but various other things that will make it easier to pick and choose and build systems out of it. That's important. Um, <clears throat> I will continue to flag wave for things like CI and testing, in particular network testing. Uh, this is something we've talked about endlessly, and things have definitely gotten better. CI has gotten better. Our automated, automated tests have gotten better. Um, we have a TCP test suite that 
various people have worked on, including Michael Tixon, that kind of work needs to be promoted and continued um, because, you know, we want to put out the best code we possibly can, and we can't do that if we're not testing our code effectively. So those are the things I intend to work on over the next year. It's a short list. It should be done within nine months. <clears throat> okay. So we have a question from Alan Jude, which I'll read, and I'll let you guys respond. It's, it's great to not be on court. Um, what can we do to improve the quality of the release notes? And and, and I can, I'll, I'll finish this question, then I'll comment. There are currently mostly a semi-automated big list of changes, but they often don't include a highlight section of big ticket items, like why this release is important. Um, <clears throat> But we also need something a bit more like updating, things to watch out for while upgrading, like the p-state thing breaking PowerD, which I didn't know that broke PowerD, the VLAN type issue, and various other hiccups upgrading for folks who are upgrading to 13.0. So that's Alan's question. Um, I will comment a bit. I actually helped a bit with trying to work on our release notes for 13, and it is definitely a slog. I found it much helpful when people would put things into the rel notes file that we added this time around than trying to troll commit logs, but it does, it also seems that like uh, the sense of the right level of detail, like I think at times we have too much detail about small things in our release notes and then admit entire bullet points about actual big changes. So that's my kind of little bit of thoughts, but I'm going to turn it over to you guys. What do y'all yeah. think about improving the quality of the release notes? Yeah, we, 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 do need, we do need to move away from the bullet point. VM rewrote the system and, you know, where it needs uh, more explanation. I mean, I, yeah, I created the rel notes file specifically to try and help with that. Cause I, whenever trying to find, uh, like whenever I was trying to help with release notes in, in the past, uh, it, it was a slog exactly as John said. Um, rel notes has kind of worked, I think, um, but also kind of failed in the sense that like the, the, there's a few people who are good at updating it um, and a lot of people uh, don't and, and, and I mean that I'm, I'm sure that's just an omission. Um, I, I ultimately think that's the sort of thing that kind of has to be curated by a couple of people or at least a small group of people with kind of similar uh, sensibilities regarding like what level of detail goes into release notes. Um, just based on the fact that you know, like I, I can't see any solution other than to have a, a checklist item every time you push a commit, oh, is this release notes worthy? And we already have that in the template, right? Um, I don't know what else we can do to have developers um, proactively do that, that kind of work. Yeah, um, I think Mark, one thing that's interesting to me is um, with respect to the addition of, of rel notes, uh, I think it, it definitely has worked out well in, in certain cases. Um, I think we don't have a lot of consistency necessarily um, with what we've told, how, how we've told developers to treat it. Um, and but like you mentioned, we, we have the, the rel notes, yes or no tag in the, um, uh, in the commit template. And uh, it, it's, I mean, putting rel notes, yes, in a commit template is a very, different uh, action than adding a, an entry into the rel notes file itself. Um, and I think, yeah, we could, we could sort of try and formalize that a little bit more. And um, it, it may well, perhaps, perhaps uh, rel notes as a file, as opposed to um, uh, the commit tag is a better approach. Um, really, we ought to be writing the release notes for FreeBSD 14 right now. Right. Um, yeah, that, that's kind of what I had in mind with this notion of curated, right? Like, yeah. you know, if, if it was if it was, say, a weekly task for someone to go through that week's commit logs and try to identify something noteworthy and reach out to the uh, developers making those changes to see if they can get some clarity or whatever, um, then, yeah, we'd, we'd save a whole bunch of sadness at the end of the release cycle. Um, I was actually wondering, Mark, I mean, I know you've been doing some of this, but maybe one of the things we should do is try and recruit someone from the doc team to work with release or whoever, someone who can, who I mean, many people who are source committers can write, but 
um, someone who really can turn something into narrative so it's not the bullet points um, and can do the highlight thing. It might be good to try and get those two teams to talk to each other or get get Greg on the foundation to do some of it, but that seems like a it would be a huge task for someone to do as a, a job. It'd probably be better if we could get someone from the doc team to do it. Or, or several someones or have a, you know, a best practice that, you know, when you commit a feature, you know, to send things off or to have somebody on the doc team going, hey, that looks like a feature. Can you send me a quote about it? Or, you know, yeah. something, I think, I think you're right, George, that it needs, there needs to be some oversight, but um, it needs to go both ways. You know, someone who, you know, who the developers know to contact, hey, I got this thing, here's my crappy English, can you turn it into like something people would want to read? And on the other hand, you know, that's also active and cognizant enough in the community to go, hey, this needs release notes. Or maybe we have some developers watching that and send this person ideas so they can coordinate it or I don't know. But, you know, something that um, encourages people to talk to each other um, and uh, rather than um, like we've been doing, putting it all off to the last minute. You know, it's well, a part of the, your thing. It's part the, of your thing, thing about really, documentation. Yeah. You know? The thing I really want to... Um, uh, the thing I really want to emphasize, though, is it needs to be someone who can do a bit of narrative, right? What our current updating or rel notes usually miss are a narrative, right? And if we figure out a way to do this right, if it's someone from Doc or, you know, someone from Source or someone from Source and Doc or whatever, if we figure out a, the right structure, not only do we get better release notes, which are more useful to the community at large, we also get, you know, the biannual article for the FreeBSD Journal of what's new in X, it's a lot easier to do that if the release notes are more of a narrative form than a set of bullet points. Well, I, so there's several things I think. I think Mark's right about timeliness. <clears throat> it is a lot easier to talk about the changes you've made uh, usefully right when you've made them as opposed to two years later. Uh, so I think timeliness is good. And I think that just to be explicit, um, you write Release notes is a different audience than a commit long. It is part of why the rel notes yes is kind of a fail and why having a separate file as Mark has done is useful. You write something different in release notes than you write in a commit log. In a commit log, you say, well, I fixed this foobar because this was broken and under this race condition, this happened or yada yada, or this implements this new version of this protocol. And the release notes is something like, oh, well now the Beehive VNC works with the screen, capture, the screen share thing in Mac OS. That's what the user cares about. They don't care about that net supporting XYZ compression with VNC protocol 2.7 or so like what, like the details that we put in the commit log are not the same thing as what matters to the user that you want to write into release notes. Like the release notes need to be more abstract and they have to be targeted at like, it's just a different layer. And that's part of why, like I know I try to write stuff into rel notes that is more targeted at that level of topic, not the topic of what you put in the commit log, which seems to be different because the commit log is helpful for doing code archaeology in the future when you're doing and blame or annotate want to know why this doesn't check this condition this way and it, there's just different audiences and so the rel notes yes thing means that whoever is curating the rel notes has to then go back look at the commit log and try to reverse engineer well, what in the heck does this mean to a user to try to fix like that, that's one of the problems i ran into when trying to work on some of the 13.0 release notes was looking at some of the detailed stuff and seeing if i could reframe them and collapse them into kind of more succinct descriptions that were interesting to users, not to developers. So I, I really like the idea of curating it like once a week or once a month, but it, I do think it's important that, to have this notion of who the different audience is and writing to that audience. And just explicit that it can't be the same text. It needs to be different text. So, I mean, even hints in the commit logs can help if you at least are hinting why some change matters to users, not just why it matters to the flow of the code. Sorry, I'm so boxing. Um, no, I, you're, you're absolutely right. We, there were Tony running for core on, next year. Yeah, there were there were several <laughs> comments on uh, Dev Summit that um, you know we're talking about why uh, um, you know what you were saying was good. Yes, I even got dinged.
So I have another question. I'm not sure if, so this is from Nick Wolf. I think it's along the same lines. He said that he would say that reviews need more statement of what their impact is supposed to be, not just what is technically being done, which I think is probably in line with what I was asking about. I mean, effectively what people want is not just what, but why, right? I'm I mean, gonna go check the, see if there's any more we need to talk about for this topic. Okay. But, I mean, the bullet points thing is what, what changed? This file changed, this bug was fixed. But, you know, for a larger, for an actual feature, you want to explain why, why did we add this? Why did we change the VM system? Why did we, you know, integrate something new into the network stack? Or, you know, what, what is the purpose of this thing? Is it adherence to an ex external standard? You know, in the case of a lot of networking stuff, we do things for adherence to external standards. Is it to provide, you know, I mean, the, the hardware access is the most obvious one. Oh, we added a device driver for this new chip. Right. Well, without that code, then you don't have the device driver for the chip. The chip doesn't work. Have a nice day. Um, but I, I think a lot of people are very used to saying what they did, and are and fewer people are used to saying why it's there. Or as as someone I worked with used to always do in their commits, their commit message was two words. It was bug fixed. I was very happy when we got rid of that person. You know, the, the, the suggestion they're amplifying on um, in the uh, um, on IRC, it was basically that we start thinking about release notes as part of the review process. So we, we move it back a step from, oh, I just committed a bunch of changes. Maybe I better update rel notes to um, have it be earlier in the process. If that's going to be a change, it's going to be something user visible. And so that gets people thinking about things earlier and we invite, you know, we have it more integrated into our process. If I'm understanding um, Dark Fiber's comments correctly. Yeah, and Warner, I think that's a really good point. Um, I think uh, one of the things we should try to promote is taking a more holistic um, view of new feature development. And so when we have a um, uh, I guess, as opposed to sort of you know, sometimes release notes will mention bug fixes or new drivers or something like that. And that's, that's a different kind of, of category. But in the specific case of, you know, some significant new functionality that's being developed, um, in addition to writing or thinking about the release notes uh, at the time that we're developing that feature, we should be also making sure that um, the tests are updated, that the documentation for that feature exists, whether that's the handbook, the man page, whatever it is, right? And a lot of times we've had, um, oh, some code lands, and then later on some documentation, you know, man page update lands, and then later on maybe, maybe the handbook gets a chapter added or something. Um, and it's not necessarily the case that the same person has to do all of that work or that, you know, the feature um, uh, is going to be rejected out of hand until that's all done. But sort of as a, a development community, we should say, these are the things that we want to happen as part of this feature development. And let's figure out how to make sure that they all happen um, as this feature gets uh, comes to completion. Well, do we want to maybe do something like discourage the use of rel notes yes and encourage people to add rel notes entries i mean i think from my perspective it's a lot easier to take an existing rel notes entry and kind of adjust the language for style um because i did the style passes this last time but like to take the idea and play with the wording is a lot easier than to still have to do the thing of re-intuit like reverse engineer what's meaningful from commit logs i mean that, having I the thing so far, we, we really I mean, I had a series earlier, like a few months ago, where effectively I had a rel notes tag, but we decided a rel notes diff, but I dropped it in favor of using the tag instead. But do we want to maybe change our policy and encourage the other way around? I think we want both um, because the tag is easy. So, you know, it's if we can at least get people to say, hey, this probably requires rel notes, that means someone can post process and be like, oh, Bob said this requires, you know, rel notes. Let's go ask Bob or Alice or whoever. Um, if we make it such that the the barrier to entry is higher, where they actually have to write a rel notes entry, I think fewer people will do it. So I think, you know, it would be great to encourage people to write a paragraph, um, but there also ought to be just a tick box so that you know people who 
are overwhelmingly terrified of writing prose can be like, here, this thing probably requires some real notes, which means send, you know, that, that tag means send me email to ask me. Yeah, the, that gets but back a little bit. My experience in 13 was I looked at the real notes file and I didn't bother doing the git grep to try to find all the commit logs because it would have been too much. I think, I think John, by the time you're sitting down to write the release notes and doing the git grep, it's too late, um, which yeah. is what you've said earlier that we need to do it earlier. And that I think if we put rel notes equal yes, I think that you know the folks on the doc team that are handling the release notes should contact people to um, you know get the text, and they should add it to the rel notes file. Whether we can continue to have that in head, or we merge you know that stuff and um, you know what the folks are writing somewhere else, as long as it's well known where things should land, um, I think that's a good thing. Um, I, but I don't think that rel notes yes is going to be sufficient. We're going to need some other things around it to, if if the project really wants to have better release notes. We're going to need somebody or some bodies looking at this and doing the work. Okay, I think I think that horse might have gone on to its reward. Um, I don't see any other questions. I actually want to look and make sure first. So we've got about almost 15 minutes, well, like 12 or 13 minutes. So I'll give you maybe one more. Um, I'll give you an open-ended question, which is, what are some things that you see? Um, you know, I'll figure out how you all want to answer this. Um, what are some kind of coming things that you may see that are relevant to FreeBSD's future in the next three to five years? Like, are there trends? Are there things that we're not, are there, like, are there things we're not addressing that we need to address that we need to be watching out for, like changes in technology or so forth, um, or, or cultural changes or other things? Um, are there other kinds of Big picture where you think FreeBSD needs to go? Are there markets we're missing? You know, what, however you want to play with the ball, what do you see about a little bit more future beyond just the next two years, but more of the three to five year range? One of the things that we'll see in that time frame, I, I can think of a lot of things, and this one's just one of the technical ones. Um, our storage system has been, our storage stack is built primarily on the assumption that. IO is expensive, and if we do a little bit of extra processing um, on the way down, nobody's going to notice. Um, as the number of IOPS gets higher and we move to things like NVDIMs and non-traditional storage, um, that poses two problems. One is all of a sudden these assumptions aren't true anymore, so that little bit of extra locking, that's yeah, going to hurt you a lot. Um, as well as, um, you know, as the block paradigm um, do for replacement. Is there going to be, you know, some key value pair paradigm that gets standardized that we need to support, or, you know, something like that? In in some ways, it's kind of, you know, file systems beyond beyond POSIX that people talk about every so often, and nothing ever seems to catch on. But th those are sort of the things that we need to be on the lookout for uh, from a technical perspective. So that's the one thing that came to my mind. Um, there's a number of things we need to do socially, but that's my talk tomorrow, so. Um, so I also will talk about technological things because why not? Um, <clears throat> so there's a few things. One is uh, Intel is dead. And so Intel will not be the main place where our code runs in three to five years because we'll see how, we'll see how things play out. But at the moment, they are not the interesting architecture, ARM is. Um, we're already well placed on ARM, but we have to remain there and we have to remain competitive on ARM. Um, being on ARM as opposed to being on Intel, which was not just Intel, but basically, you know, 20 years or 30 years of Windows plus Intel forcing servers and desktops and laptops into a particular format. Um, that doesn't exist in the ARM world. So we need to be able to address things like SOCs and different ISAs that are within ARM, if you think of things like the M1 chip, which is not exactly in ARM64, 
it's an ARM64 that's been, you know, dosed by Apple. Um, and then, you know, risk five, right? So we're well placed in a lot of these things currently because we have people who've worked on them and people who continue to work on them. But it's those are now the expanding markets. You know, every so many years, um, the industry branches out into a bunch of new architectures. Some of them live, some of them die. Intel has had a very good run. Um, we will see if they can they can rebound. Um, but <clears throat> the way we support architectures is probably going to have to change over the next three to five years as you wind up running on systems that really are not going to look like each other in the way that Intel-based Windows-based systems looked like each other when we started. Um, that's one thing. The other is security. Um, you know, we're again well placed because we've got Robert Watson and a ton of people at Cambridge working on Cherry, which is a very advanced way of dealing with the fact that C programming is awful um, and C code is awful and we're going to keep running C for a long time. So, you know, those kinds of changes, we're well placed to pick up because a lot of that research is being done by people we know and who know and love FreeBSD. But that, um, that kind of technology is going to continue to uh, become more relevant. Uh, it's pretty much the case that at the moment, um, security, computer security is so awful uh, that something is going to have to change. And if we're lucky, it'll all go in the cherry direction because we're already there. Um, if we're not lucky, there will be other changes we're going to have to adapt to. I think those are the two big areas for the next three to five years for, for any operating system, not just for BSD. Anybody else in core want to take a stab? Um, okay, so I, I will oh. go ahead. Uh, so uh, I love to see the uh, um, uh for the next five years. Uh, so I love to see the flexibility of the uh, usage of the FreeBSD. I mean, the, flexi the word flexibility is the uh, for example, the reusability of the subsystem in the uh, in the another system, for example. So, uh, FreeBSD is a complete OS, and we have uh, we are proud of the uh, we are shipping the complete OS. But uh, 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 there are a lot of other systems uh, in the market, and the FreeBSD can be fit uh, into the uh, small part of the other system. So, our network stack is we used. Uh, extensively uh, in various places but uh, if we pick up the a single functionality from the FreeBSD and use it in uh, on another system for example the Linux or Windows it is difficult to build them and uh, uh, there is uh, some difficulty to maintain it so uh, for example the um, so network stack is already uh, used as a user land library. Uh, so FreeBSD network stack is used in such a way that uh, we do not support um, the FreeBSD development ecosystem. So if we put this uh, more flexibility to the such a subsystem, uh, along with the uh, normal development of the um, FreeBSD as a single OS, uh, we will find a um, uh, new, new market to make the FreeBSD as a, a useful OS. It, it's a difficult to overcome the other big OSs in the market, but uh, 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 improving, so uh, put the effort to make our uh, FreeBSD uh, distribution as a toolkit will be an interesting target for the next four or five years, I think. Okay, Mark, did you want to go to, I think? Yeah, I was going to say something uh, fairly related to what uh, Sato-san did. Um, it seems like, at least looking at Linux, there's a trend towards uh, um, changing the way the traditional IO path works in 
kind of monolithic operating systems where you have to do a system call to do each unit of IO. Mm. So IO Uring is very popular in Linux these days. It's also very common to have user space, um, user space implementations, uh, network stacks and storage stacks and so on. And that's, that's not a new trend obviously, but it's, it's one that doesn't seem to be going away. Um, Aside from performance, uh, it's, it's attractive, I think, to vendors because it makes the implementation a lot more malleable. You don't have to wait for your kernel to be updated with whatever bug fix to the TCP stack. Um, you, can, you can iterate a lot more rapidly. Um, so, I mean, FreeBSD does have some technology around these lines, but uh, uh, you know, there, there, there's a few different places. We have NetMap, we have you know, a fairly robust AIO implementation. We have, um, there's, there's an interface in CAM, I can't remember what it's called offhand, where you can kind of asynchronously queue CCPs uh, to a disk. Um, so we, we have a lot of pieces of, of those, we, we have a lot of pieces that you can leverage to, to address um, the, the kinds of problems that I think a lot of larger enterprise users are interested in solving. Um, but it doesn't feel particularly cohesive. And, and uh, I think we're gonna have to spend some time catching up to uh, uh, at least where, where Linux is going in terms of the momentum. Yeah, the IO ring example is a particularly good one, um, Mark. It's one the one of the other things in the storage stack that we need to you know adjust to that not everything's going to come in as a block request. Um, so that's that's a very good point. And I mean the 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 way, like solutions. There's, there's a lot of architectures where you can, I, I, I'm looking for a reason to bring up, uh, you know, kind of any kernels or rump kernels where you, you kind of link parts of the kernel into your application um, instead of uh, uh, making effectively RPCs into the kernel. Um, I've, I've wondered a lot lately about whether uh, it, would, it would benefit FreeBSD to, to adopt, uh, adopt some of the technologies, the, at least the ones that have originated in NetBSD with respect to uh, rump kernels. But I mean, I, I don't have enough expertise to, to really say it's more just uh, something to think about. Okay. Um, not really a question, but uh, I'll just note it and see if any of you would like to offer some feedback. Um, uh, Vince from Discord <clears throat> noted that big dot little CPUs are going to be the norm at every scale very soon and that our scheduler needs to be aware of this and support big.little. Um, so do you, are you guys aware of anybody working on big.little support or where that state might be? So I think the short answer is um, that uh, there's nobody um, actively, uh, actively working on it uh, at the moment. Um, it, it it is the case that the the big big dot little kind of concept is um, uh, originated in the ARM world, but yeah, it's, it's going to appear um, appear el elsewhere. Um, and I suspect that what will will happen is that as part of the um, the sort of FreeBSD Foundation's funded efforts on uh, for BSD on ARM, that'll be a, a task that needs to, to slot in um, in that uh, in that domain. That, that's my my likely guess. I don't know if anyone else on court has has thoughts. I think that'll be part of it, Ed. Um, but I th also think that um, it's more than oh, we, we need some special case code that this CPU can handle a lot. Certainly, yeah. Handle, you know, there needs to be. Uh, some thought given to other considerations, like um, I'll use more power if I schedule it this way versus that way, or um, you know something I'll use more cores or something. It's more of a you know the we need to be more dynamic and take more things into account than we have in the past, while still um, maintaining a reasonable level of complexity and predictability. Um, you know, in our systems, particularly when these additional features aren't enabled, so. So one other thing on big, little, and power, by the way, like electricity, 
Um, a bunch of us, or some of us have at least talked to Robin at ARM, who's who did a lot of the framework that he tried to get into Linux. Linux refused it. Uh, we've looked at that stuff with Robin on and off over the years. And I think, you know, that's something where we really need to go and talk to him and maybe some other people who worked on this stuff for other kernels um, and see if there are, if not code, ideas that could be integrated into our system. Um, because, you know, those chips sit in very low power devices and, and definitely are always big little or often big little. Okay, well, I'm going to check. We're actually at the end of our slot. We have a little bit of time before our our next thing for the our last thing for the day. But I'm going to give a few minutes to see if we get any more questions that come in. Um, um, I would say that we could probably spend a good 20, 30 minutes talking about power management. So I'm not going to open that can of worms right now. But uh, there's a lot more to power management than just um, in CPU scheduling is part of it, but there's there's a lot more down that rat hole. So I'm not even going to open it. But I'm going to look around for a few minutes just to make sure if we have any other questions that I've missed for core. But if not, then I think um, we're going to go ahead and take this is kind of the end of our main track for the day. Uh, well, or at least a, a good chunk of our main track for the day. We're going to take a bit of an extended break for about 30 minutes or so, so folks can stretch your legs, um, maybe try to obtain a meal if it makes sense. Uh, and after that, we're going to come back for our final event of today, which is going to be st story time with Kirk McCusick. So don't run off. I mean, well, you need to go grab something to eat or something, do that, but definitely come back. Um, don't just go away forever. Uh, you'll definitely want to hear from Kirk um, I always enjoy when he has story time. So we'll see you all in about 30 minutes or so. And you can also welcome to hang out on uh, the hallway track while we're waiting for 30 minutes. Uh, and I guess, oh, okay. So when Kirk is going to talk, he's actually going to pick from the three different sections of early BSD kind of history that he can talk about. And so there's actually a poll here if you're on the Zoom webinar where you can vote for which of these you would find interesting. Uh, the three options are the early BSD history, uh, the TCP IP wars, or about the USL UC Berkeley lawsuit. So we'll leave that pulled up for now for during 30 minutes so y'all can vote on the webinar and we'll use that to decide which part Kirk will talk about when we get back. Uh, we'll see you all in about 30 minutes. So thank you all for being here so far. Thanks for hosting, John. Thanks, John. Oh, sure. Thanks, John.
Hello, John. Hello. Hello, everyone. Welcome back for our last session for our first day today. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. It's been fun so far. We've had several good talks. We've had a lot of chatter and discussion um, over on IRC and on YouTube. Um, I was, I've also been hanging out a bit in the hallway track. We were talking some more about release notes and automating some of that process. Sorry, the hallway track laptop is over there, so I keep looking over there. Um, we've been talking about various things, and uh, I know we'll probably hang out a bit more. I um, mean, certainly tomorrow, I think, after the session is over, we'll probably spend quite a bit of time continuing some of the discussions of tomorrow in the hallway track. So if you haven't joined yet, I would encourage you to go jump on that call, get involved. Um, but now, for the last session today, we're going to, we have a real treat. So Kirk has agreed to give us a good chunk of his time and share so, uh, some stories from early BSD with us. So I don't know if you can see the poll, Kirk. We put up a poll with the three things you had suggested to me. Um, it looks like in the poll so far, the TCP IP wars is a, a majority, not just a plurality. It has over 50% of the vote. So that would be the, seem to be the one that people have most asked for. Okay, well, that's the one I've done the last two times you've listened to it. So you, I, I you as the moderator can say the second choice is this and pick one of the other two if you want. Um, I know that I, I have that ability, but I try not to be a dictator a lot of the time. Um, I think it's, you know, hmm. It's fine if we go with TCP IP wars. I think if we had to pick another one, some of the other people at IRC mentioned that they would really find it interesting to hear your side of the story of the lawsuit, because we know that um, some of the details of the lawsuit were released publicly already, or a few years ago. Now you can actually see uh, the actual legal documents themselves that were filed. But I think um, if we were not to do TCP IP wars, I think probably folks would be interested in the lawsuit story. But I, I think it's also fine to, to hear the How about we'll do this? I, I will, rather than totally focusing in on one topic, I will sort of split my time between TCP IP wars and the, the lawsuit. Well, that will totally work for me. Um, so a question that Ed has, uh, are you fine with, any, with all of this discussion being recorded and streamed? Or would you rather some of this not be recorded in stream? Uh, the, at this point, the lawsuit stuff that I'll be talking about is all out. And as you said, it's, it's been released to the public. So it's right. it, there's no issues there. Any, there. There was at one time, but there isn't now. Fair My lips have been unsealed. <laughs> <laughs> OK, well, I'm going to turn it over to you. And then I'm going to hide myself. And I'll let you go. OK, uh, I do for the people out there in the uh, Zoom land. Uh, I do not have slides. Uh, all I have is some notes. And these, <laughs> the, the, the history of these notes is actually interesting because the very first time I was asked to give this talk was in 1986. Uh, and it was for the Australian Unix Users Group meeting, which was being held in Perth, Australia. And so uh, I actually flew into Melbourne and then from Melbourne took the Indian Pacific train across the country, which takes three days. And so these notes are handwritten notes that I wrote on the train as we were going across the Nullarbor Plain, which is the, the, it, it, the, it's so flat that you can sort of look in the distance and see the curvature of the earth. Uh, it's the longest set of railroad tracks without a bend in the rail it goes on for a hundred and something miles without a bend in the rail. All right, so we'll just kind of uh, blip over the, the early bits. Uh, Unix got started at Bell Labs uh, when uh, Bell Labs had been involved in Multics, but the Multics project uh, had kind of descended into uh, never ending research and they were never really converging on a system. And so Bell Labs withdrew from the Multics project. And uh, at that point, uh, Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie were, were stuck with going back to batch processing. And they'd had a taste of, of a interactive operating system and they wanted to continue that. And so they actually started on a PDP-7, uh, which they wrote a, what they called at the time a real-time operating system, mostly so they could write a, a Star Wars type of game. 
uh, and uh, that was eventually called Unix. So there's there's people that debate whether that can be called Unix, but if you go to the Unix Heritage Society, uh, they'll, they'll say that was the first Unix. At any rate, they fairly soon moved on to a PDP-11 and uh, the, the, uh, the PDP-11 was originally written in assembly language, but fairly quickly, uh, Dennis came up with the C language and they converted the uh, Unix over to being written in C which is obviously where it's stayed ever since. So um, that went through several releases uh, and or several versions, they called them. And uh, an early, very early version four arrived at Berkeley uh, when uh, Bob Fabry, who had heard about Unix when he went to uh, the uh, conference, the ACM conference on operating systems where it had been first presented by uh, probably by Ken Thompson. And uh, since Ken, uh, Ken Thompson was an alumnus of Berkeley, uh, Berkeley got a little bit of extra uh, special pull. So uh, Berkeley got a PDP-11 and got this early version of, of Unix. And Ken Thompson actually came out and did a six month sabbatical at Berkeley. And that's when it really got kind of cemented. Um, that's also when Bill Joy got to Berkeley, uh, matriculated as a student and uh, sort of under Ken's tutelage, got up to speed with Unix and became what you today call the system administrator for the system. Uh, now, Bill started uh, building a number of tools that ran on Unix, the VI editor, which of course is still with us today, and uh, the pas a Pascal compiler. And he also uh, was, was not super enamored of the, the shell that was available and so decided to do his own, uh, which he called C shell. And I've always found it somewhat amusing that someone who was getting a PhD in programming languages could come up with a syntax as horrible as the C shell. Uh, but that's no accounting for how that ended up happening. Anyway, the first uh, BSD distributions uh, were the Bill really just packaging up the utilities that he'd written. So the C shell, the editor, the Pascal compiler, and some other things. Uh, and this, so you would just get these utilities and then drop them on your existing Unix system. Uh, so then what ended up happening next was that um, Berkeley got one of the very first VAX computers, uh, actually serial number seven. And uh, it came, of course, with the uh, DEC VMS operating system. But uh, the people at Berkeley really much preferred Unix to VMS. And so uh, Bill basically took a, the quick and dirty uh, hack of something called 32V which was a port that the folks at Bell Labs did to the VAX, but it didn't utilize any of the paging hardware on the VAX. It was just a swap-based system, just like the PDP-11. Uh, but Bill added a, the VM system that had been done by uh, Olzop Babagalu, and so took the 32V, added the, the actual uh, VM paging stuff to it, and then packaged that up, and that was released as uh, the, the, was sort of the first release from Berkeley that was a complete operating system with all of the utilities on top of it. Uh, and that came out as, as 3BSD. And so, uh, you know, 3BSD was such, you know, was so much better than 32V that 32V generally just wasn't used. People uh, would simply get a license from AT&T for Unix, and then they would just bring up um, 3BSD on it. So uh, at the same time now, uh, there's sort of a, in parallel going on with this is uh, DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, which was uh, responsible for the research budget of the various branches of the US military. And the idea was that they, instead of having each branch do their own uh, research projects, they instead pooled all their resources and then had this, this department in DARPA to figure out how it ought to be used. 
So in the in doing stuff with computers, uh, what had been sort of the norm up to that point was that every research group sort of had their own computer with their own operating system, their own utilities, the languages they were using differed. And so it was very, very hard to take something that one research group had created and you make use of it by another research group. So DARPA decided that, all right, going forward, we're going to pick a particular piece of hardware, a particular operating system, a small set of languages, and that's what we're going to have all of the people that we do funding for use. And so they decided on the VAX because that was uh, the, the powerful enough, but at a price point that they could afford to buy a bunch of them for all of their various different uh, people that they were funding. Uh, there was a bit of debate then, should they run with the vendor supported operating system VMS or should they run with Unix? Um, there was a great sort of bake off that happened uh, and uh, ultimately was decided that it would be Unix. And so, okay, that's good. But now they needed somebody who was going to stand in and actually get the things they needed in Unix into it. And so for this uh, task, they decided that they would fund Berkeley. So they would fund Berkeley to, to uh, essentially take Berkeley Unix, which had a lot of the things that they already wanted, and then they would get them to add other things that they needed. In particular, they needed a, a, a faster file system. They needed, uh, they wanted networking brought over. Uh, at that point, the only networking that was available in Unix was UUCP, Unix to Unix copy, which was a store and forward over dial up lines. Uh, and uh, so none of the interactive stuff like say Telnet or any of those things uh, that we would have uh, later. Okay. so. Uh, the oh, the uh, they also wanted to have uh, sort of more features, the MMAP feature in the virtual memory, which didn't exist at that time. So Bill wrote up this architecture for Unix uh, for for BSD, uh, which was you know put together in a month and was really uh, you know if you go back and look at that document today, it it still looks surprisingly uh, accurate for where we ought to be. Um, and so the, uh, the, the dealing with the file system fell to me, and that's another interesting piece of the story, but I'm not gonna go through that today. Um, rather, what I wanna do is focus in on the networking because that's gonna actually play a role both in this middle part and in the, when we get to the lawsuit. So uh, the, the dealing with the networking was, it really was broken into two pieces. One was we had to come up with an API to access it. I mean, all the networking such as it existed other than UUCP at that point was you would open a slash dev and do something with it. Uh, and uh, they, they, they wanted to actually have the networking integrated into the interface. Uh, and that of course was the, in that document that I described that was drawn up by Bill uh, was what the socket interface that we have today. And then of course they needed the, the TCP IP component, which was gonna be one of the protocols that would run under these sockets. Uh, at that time we had NCP, uh, which was built in, you know, it was sort of looked like a device and you opened it up and fiddled with it. Uh, but the, that among other aspects of NCP, it had only a, an eight bit uh, address because I mean, who could imagine that you would have 250 hosts on your network. But uh, it began to, it was becoming clear that maybe that wasn't going to be enough. I mean, you know, there were already like 20 different contractors that DARPA was doing and, you know, that could expand. Uh, so the one of the early debates was uh, how big should the addresses be in TCP IP? And there were three groups. There were the people that said it should be 16 bits, there were people that said it should be 32 bits, and there were people that said it should be 48. Uh, we at Berkeley were in the camp that said it should be 48 because the uh, you know, we were looking to Xerox Park, who were really the leaders uh, in in networking stuff at that time, 
And they had gone from their three megabit ethernet, which had an eight bit station address. Uh, when they went to the 10 megabit ethernet, that they put a 48 bit address on. And in, in their networking uh, model, the station address of the, the ethernet was your address. Uh, and so, you know, you needed 48 bits in order to be able to map obviously to the, to the 48 bits on the, the hardware. Uh, well, the, uh, as you can imagine, uh, with the relatively slow backbones that we had, 50 uh, kilobit backbones, they didn't want to squander having to have 12 bytes of, you know, half of which were going to be zeros all the time for, for add the to and from addresses. And so uh, we, we, we had to compromise and go with the 32 bits. And I think that uh, a lot of the issues of, of trying to switch to IPv6 that we've been struggling with for the last 20 years could have been avoided if we'd simply had 48-bit addresses. But nevertheless, 32 bits it would be. All right, so again, something that in retrospect looks kind of crazy, but they decided, you know, these kids at Berkeley, you know, they, they couldn't possibly be trusted to, to know how to write networking protocols. But we'll let them write, you know, design and write the API because that's just trivial and you know doesn't require any thought. Uh, and meanwhile, we're going to get a real company, both Burlington and Newman, BBNN, to do the actual protocols itself. So anyway, uh, we got to design the the API, the Socket API, and uh, Bill got that hacked together pretty quickly, and so he was now ready to drop in. Uh, the TCP IP. So he calls uh, Rob Gerwitz at, at BBNN and says, okay, um, you know, we, we need something to test. And Rob says, well, you know, all I got is, you know, this kind of half written prototype here, but uh, I'll send it to you so you can start playing around with it. And uh, so, so Bill, Bill gets it, puts it in. And in, uh, at that point, uh, BBNN was testing over these uh, 50 uh, kilobit backbones, but we had these super fast three megabit uh, Ethernet cards that we'd gotten from Xerox Park, uh, and we were running on VAC 750s. Those were our test machines, and a VAC 750 is approximately 0 0.7 MIPS, uh, and this, you know, a thousand. You know, the machines today are thousands of times faster. Your phones are thousands of times faster. Uh, at any rate. Uh, the, the, the thing that Rob Gerwitz had designed was this beautiful state machine with, you know, all the states were defined in the, the TCP IP states and it would transition from one to the next and, uh, you know, very modular code, et cetera, but it wasn't very fast. And in fact, uh, when you had your VAC 750 sat CPU saturated, it could only push about, oh, 50 kilobits per per second across this backbone. And Bill's like, well, this is crazy. We ought to be able to do much better than this. So he goes in and just goes hack, 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 you know, so that all the state transitions just turn into go-tos and, uh, you know, it turns into one giant blob of code, but by gosh, it runs quickly. And in fact, can almost saturate the three megabit uh, ethernet. So at any rate, uh, there's a lot of people that want to try it. And so a, a test release of this goes out, something called 4.1a. Uh, and a lot of people start working with it. A lot of bugs start getting fixed. A lot of further performance improvements happen, so on and so forth. So eventually, uh, the folks at BBNN finish up their, their code and send it to us and say, all right, here's the actual thing that you should be using. And uh, you know, so we do, you know, we try dropping it in, but, you know, it's super slow and it's got a whole bunch of bugs in it and it looks a lot different than what people have been working on. And so uh, we say, well, you know, thank you, but, you know, what we've got is working uh, considerably better and, you know, we, we, we don't really need that, that final release of yours. Well, the folks at BBNN were not at all amused by this. And so they said, but, but you have to, you know, we're the ones that DARPA paid to do this. And I won't, I'll just note on the side that they were paid four times as much money as Berkeley was being paid. Uh, and so, uh, you know, 
you need to do it. You need to put it in. And so it's, you know, it got to loggerheads and uh, eventually, um, you know, we just released it. We released 4.2 with the, the, the version that we'd been working on. And so at this point, then uh, BBNN goes to DARPA and said, look, you know, these people at Berkeley aren't doing the right thing and you need to make them do this. And so the, the, the DARPA folks agreed with them. And so they came to us at Berkeley and said, um, you, you, you need to put the BBN code in. And, you know, Berkeley is, is sort of said, you know, known as being sort of hotheads and not really following orders very well. And uh, so we just said, well, no, I mean, we've done this analysis and no, which it's not the right thing to do. And uh, so anyway, it, it went back and forth for a while, but ultimately it was decided that uh, we would need to have a, we, we, the two sides would agree to a bake-off. And so a neutral third party would be found and would take, you know, the two different implementations and run a bunch of tests on them and write up a report. And everybody agreed that they would abide by whatever that decision was of that, of that tester. And so then DARPA, uh, you know, runs around and eventually decides that, uh, this guy named Mike Moose at the Ballistics Research Laboratory in Aberdeen, Maryland, uh, would be the tester. And, you know, Mike Moose was you know, sort of on the inside of stuff at DARPA. And, uh, you know, so BBNN's like, yeah, great, great guy. Well, it turns out that, that Mike Moose had been one of the primary testers of the stuff we'd been doing at Berkeley. So we're like, mm, yeah, fine, sure. That, we'll go with that. So anyway, we send it off. And uh, uh, then, of course, there's the question of what kind of tests ought to be run. Well, you know, what we were testing for was low loss networks with high throughput. That, that was our target goal. But DARPA also had a great deal of interest in what happened when the networks were being disrupted. You know, like, say, something happened in Chicago and the whole city blew up that it you know, would manage to reroute through Austin, Texas or something. Uh, so one of the tests was to be that sort of at random, about 25% of the package would just be dropped on the floor. Uh, and how well would it respond to that? Well, that was, of course, not anything that we tested for. And it was something that BBN had done a lot of work on because that was in the original specification that they'd gotten as something to, to be concerned about. So we're like, okay, well, we're not quite sure how that's going to work out. But um, anyway, um, Mike Moose's report arrives uh, with, you know, the, and the first thing you do, of course, is you immediately go to the last page to see what the conclusion is going to be. Um, but it's not there. And so you read the executive summary at the front because that must be there then. Nope, not there. So you actually have to read this report and somewhere where you get to about the middle, is where it starts talking about the testing that's happened. And uh, so the first test, of course, is low loss networks and the, the BSD just absolutely blows the, the BBNN one out of the water as, as expected. But then he starts running the test where, you know, statistically it drops every, about every fourth packet or so. And uh, in this one, of course, the BBNN code just is pulling out way ahead of the, the BSD which is kind of struggling and falling back and not doing very well. But uh, as Mike Moose says, while the BBN code is rebooting, Berkeley manages to uh, you know, jump forward and in fact finishes more quickly than the BBN code does in getting the data through. So uh, the conclusion then was that it would be the, the BSD uh, code that would go out. And so that essentially put that to rest. Okay, so now uh, with, th with that behind us, we, we go on and uh, start working on some of the other things that needed to be done. Uh, this included things like uh, updating the VM system, because in order to be able to do something like MMAP, the, the original implementation just wasn't up to that. Uh, plus the original implementation was very VAC specific. And so uh, we, we needed to add you know, we, we need essentially to replace the VM. So choices were we could write our own. Uh, choice number two was to pick something that was already out there that we could adapt. 
And uh, you know, following the, the the philosophy of it's always better to uh, steal a better idea than just come up with your own. Uh, we uh, decided to look around. Uh, this was my task. So the, the two obvious candidates were the VM system that had been done by Sun Microsystems uh, and the one that had been done at Carnegie Mellon under Mach. And the, we actually liked the, the Sun Microsystems one. It was, it was better adapted because they were working, you know, it was done within Berkeley Unix, whereas the Mach system was part of a microkernel. So uh, we went to Sun, who we interacted with quite, you know, a, a lot of good flow back and forth. And, uh, you know, of course, the engineers were up for it and their managers were up for it. And it sort of trickled its way all the way up to uh, Scott McNeely, who was the CEO. And he, he thought that might not be a bad idea. Uh, and so he uh, asked his, the lawyers to draft something to, you know, make that contribution to Berkeley. And the lawyers came back and said, uh, you know, your stockholders could sue you for giving away company assets. So we really don't recommend that you do that. And so unfortunately, that was the end of that. Uh, so we were stuck with either doing our own or using mock. So we took the mock code. Of course, we rewrote the interface to have things like MMAP that we needed. Uh, and uh, so that, that went in. Uh, we were very lucky to have uh, Rick Macklem, who uh, did NFS. I had put in the, the, the VFS uh, VOP interface. Uh, and so then, and, and had moved the file system under that. And then Rick uh, got NFS up and running and plugged that in uh, into that interface as well. So all of these things then uh, eventually trickled out as 4.4 uh, BSD. Meanwhile, uh, AT&T had gotten into the, the computer operating system business. Uh, the this thing called the 1956 Dissent Decree, uh, which essentially said that IBM would do computers and not phones, and AT&T would do phones and not computers. Uh, but with the breakup of AT&T, one of the things they got to do was start doing computers. And so uh, that's when they started commercially uh, selling uh, Unix, which of course was System 3 and then later System 5. And uh, so... In the early days, since they weren't trying to use Unix commercially, uh, getting a, a source license for Unix was on the order of $20,000. And so it was you know, a, a small enough hurdle that people were, were fine with that. But once they got into the computer business, the cost of those source licenses kept rising uh, and it had gotten up to about a quarter million dollars. Uh, and that was for like, source on one machine only. And, and so there were all these smaller companies that wanted to build products that had networking in them, TCP IP in them, and they couldn't afford to get the, the AT&T license so that they could get the code from Berkeley. So they came to Berkeley and asked if uh, we could release the TCP IP code because that clearly had been written you know, that was clearly not part of the original Unix. And so uh, if we would release it as open source, then they could take that and, and adapt it in their products and not have to buy a Unix license. And so we said, well, that, you know, that's not too hard. We went through the kernel and we just took the, you know, socket interface and the, all the code and drivers and so on down from top to bottom. And we, we threw in the, uh, you know, the various utilities that we had uh, and Telnad and FTP, and unfortunately also the R commands, for those of you that are old enough to remember things like R login, which was a, a security disaster from the day it was written. Uh, you know, the, the, the security checking was, you, do you claim to be root? Yes, okay, well, in that case, do whatever you want. Um, so anyhow, this got put together and we did this as a thing called networking release one, net one. And we, of course, had to go to the Berkeley lawyers to get them to write a license or, you know, a, yeah, it, write a document that, you know, would allow its release. And there's a huge long amounts of stuff, of, you know, they wanted, like, you know, a 
four or five page copyright. And then we said, you know, this has to go into every single file and this is ridiculous. So we got it down to the, what, you know, looks like a large copyright, but in fact, uh, you know, compared to where we started from, we did pretty well, I think. At any rate, uh, this, this took this better part of a year back and forth with the Berkeley lawyers, but we finally got the, the, everything in place. And we figured this was totally ridiculous because we figured we'd sell like maybe three copies of this and then it would just go all up for, you know, anonymous download and that would be it. But it turned out that all these companies were really eager to have a piece of paper that said, you're free to redistribute this. So we actually sold nearly a thousand of these thousand dollar licenses to the various companies that all companies and other organizations that wanted to have that piece of paper, uh, which then gave us a big new chunk of money so that we could continue doing stuff, which was great. Uh, at any rate, um, we went on and uh, once we had done the release of TCP IP, people were saying, well, how about this utility? And how about that utility? And how about this? And how about that? And uh, the, the problem was that, you know, we had started from Unix. And so it was just, how did, how do you, pull apart, you know, out of the utilities, the LS utility. Well, the original Unix had an LS utility. We have an LS utility. Undoubtedly, there's still some code in there that came from the original. So how do we deal with this? Well, Keith Bostick, who was one of the folks that was working at the CSRG with us, uh, said, well, you know, we go to these USENIX conferences uh, every six months, uh, and we always do a, a BOF session. Why don't we just try and, you know, put up a list of all the utilities that we need to have rewritten. And so, you know, it was, you know, big long list of stuff that we needed in the C library and utilities that we needed. And of course, all that trivial stuff starts piling in, you know, cat, someone rewrites cat, woohoo, uh, and uh, so on and so forth. And, and Keith Bostick is, you know, collecting all this and putting it all together. And Mike and I are kind of looking in back and going, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but at one point, he comes walking into our office and says, well, guys, you know, I've got about 75% uh, of the uh, utilities and libraries uh, rewritten. How, how are you doing on that kernel? Well, you know, we couldn't really use the same technique for the kernel. We couldn't just say, here, rewrite the kernel and, you know, get your name in lights. Uh, and so, but on the other hand, it's looking like, uh, you know, this might actually have be happening. And so what are we going to do? And uh, so the upshot of this is that uh, we, we decide, okay, we'll just, we need to figure out what, what parts of the kernel are, are contaminated. And so we built um, an inverted database. We, we took the, the entire original uh, 32V kernel uh, and ran it through the, the thing that reformatted it for pretty printing to put it in a canonical form. And then we just built a database, which, you know, each entry in the, uh, each line of C code was an entry in the database. And so then we could just take our kernel, do the same, run it through the pretty printer, and then just look up each line in our kernel against that database and see if it matched. Now, obviously, you know, a line with a brace by itself at the end is going to match all over the place. So you throw out that kind of stuff. And then any place where you get a run of like three or four lines that match, you know, four lines from ours match three or four lines in the other one, you'd go and look at it. And, you know, a lot of them were false hits, but there were, you know, things where we were still doing a, a linear search through some huge table. It's like, you know, why don't we just do hash lookup on that? And so, of course, that completely changes the code. And so it, it no longer conflicts. So at any rate, when the dust finally settled, we really had only about six files left that had any, you know, significant code still from the original Unix in it. And so our next thought was, well, why don't we just, we'll just rewrite those six files. But then we, we thought better of that because if we released an entire kernel, uh, then AT&T might get upset about that. But we can say, well, this is just a subset of the kernel, you know, and it, it you know, doesn't even compile and run. And, you know, that'll, that, that wouldn't be nearly as threatening to them. So then the next thing is, of course, we've got to get this licensed by the university, you know, the, through the university lawyers. And it had been such an aggravating thing to 
do with net one that we decided, you know, instead of doing that, let's just say this is just going to be net two. This is just a, an update to the net one release. And we'll just use the net one license. Uh, and the lawyers were more or less okay with that. Um, but, uh, uh, but they said, you know, you, we need, we need you to prove to us that this is really, you know, just an update to the old one and not, you know, the new stuff you're at, it isn't going to have anything that comes across. Uh, and uh, that came across from 32V or whatever. So we, uh, we, we need to get your, the, the head of the EECS department to sign off that, you know, they're happy with this. Well, first, I think it was your professor. Well, Bob Fabry had retired at that point, so couldn't get him. And there were no other professors that really wanted to sign off on it. So we went to the head of the department and the head of the department said, yeah, no, I, I'm not signing off on that. And so then we went to the head of the College of Engineering and they weren't willing to sign off on it. And so it just continued up through the ranks. And eventually we got to somebody who was said, well, obviously I don't know enough about it. So it's going to have to actually, you know, you're going to have to hire an expert to come in and really do an analysis. So such an expert was found. And in fact, they did find some things that we had missed. Um, you know, they weren't major things, but there were a few things. And so we went through and they fixed those. And so we got a clean bill of health from them. And we finally got the sign off from the university and out it went. And just like with that one, there were many, 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 many people that were perfectly happy to pay a thousand dollars to get a piece of paper that said this is, uh, you know, redistributable. So, okay, that's great. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Mike Carls uh, and several a couple other folks from our community decided to uh, start a BSDI. Uh, so a commercial version of BSD, a company that would essentially support BSD. And uh, they, they did a few things which, in retrospect, were probably not ideal. So, for example, uh, they, they had ads that said, you know, get Unix for, you know, 90, well, on a 99% discount, uh, you know, 99% less than the cost of getting it from AT&T. And they had the uh, phone number 1-800-ITS-UNIX. So anyhow, this did get the attention of AT&T and AT&T was not amused. So uh, they're, they're, you know, they sent a cease and desist, essentially said, stop selling this product, which infringes on uh on our product uh, and of course stop selling it go out of business basically and so bsdi was like uh no no we're not going to do that and so at t filed a lawsuit uh saying that you know they had stolen at and proprietary software uh and of course the the First thing you do if you're a big company, you know, AT&T versus a four or five person company uh, is you get an injunction. You, uh, an injunction basically says what they're doing is so grievous and so harmful to us that the judge will order the company to stop shipping their product until the lawsuit is resolved, which of course is going to probably be years. So essentially it's going to put them out of business. So, uh, BSDI is now, you know, facing the, the guns of AT&T's full force coming down on them, trying to get this injunction. And so uh, they go into the, to the court and they say, well, first of all, they, you know, AT&T hasn't even told us what they claim uh, we're infringing on. They just say it's there and we can't possibly respond to it without them telling us what it is that you know, if it's so grievous, it must be obvious what it is, and they should tell us what it is. Uh, and second of all, um, all of our distribution is based on this thing from the University of California at Berkeley. All we did was add these six files, and we wrote these six files in a clean room from scratch with no reference to the AT&T materials, and uh, they haven't made any complaint about any of these six files. And all the rest of this, we have this piece of paper from the University of California that says it's freely redistributable. So 
you know, there's no room for an injunction. Okay, so normally with an injunction, the, the judge just rules, you know, he listens to the two sides and he goes, yes, no, and it's done. Uh, but uh, they can take more time if they want to. And they'll, so, you know, maybe they'll take a couple days to, you know, go and look at some of the written stuff and, and then come up with something. But I mean, all they come up with is, uh, you know, all they're required to come up with is, yes, you get the injunction or no, you don't. I mean, the whole trial, all of that is going to happen down the road. Uh, so anyway, um, several days goes by and they, he hasn't, the judge hasn't ruled on the injunction. And so, you know, I'm, the, the, the BSDI is, is saying, well, you know, when's he going to rule? And the, uh, their lawyers say, well, you know, by law, he has four weeks to make up his mind if he wants to. And uh, so a week goes by, two weeks goes by, three weeks goes by. Finally, it's coming up on the Friday or whatever the day of the week was that, you know, the thing had been held and it's four weeks. So that's the day it has to come out. And so we're just like waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. And, you know, five o'clock goes by and still not there. And so talk to the BSDI lawyers and they go, well, you know, what are you going to do? Sue him? You know, he's going to release it when he's going to release it. So anyway, six weeks later, uh, the judge puts out his, his, his ruling. And it's not like one page, yes or no. It goes on for 42 pages. And he lists all 43 grievances that are in the AT&T lawsuit and says 41 of these are patently absurd. And I'm not even going to let you bring those to court. But there's one of yours is on copyright and one of them is on trade secret. And of those two, you may have a case. And I'm going to let you bring those to court. But uh, I don't want to hear about any of the others. And secondly, this is really something that should be handled in a state court, not really at the federal level. So, uh, and you know, you can bring it to a federal level once you have a, a, a you know, the losing side of a, of a state court case. Well, uh, no, sorry, I got too far ahead of myself here. First, he said, um, right, so he said all, yeah, right. He didn't say the state court part. But he laid out the fact that, you know, they didn't really have a case. And so AT&T, rather than following what the judge had said there, uh, decided, OK, what we really need to do is sue the University of California because we don't see how we're going to get through on just these six files. All right. So now the lawsuit comes to the University of California. They are told they must immediately stop distributing, which they do. It doesn't matter, right? It's already out. So who cares? Uh, uh, but now it's not just BSDI, but it's BSDI plus the university that are going against AT&T. So now you have two big immovable forces beating up against each other. So the, uh, the upshot of this then is that those of us like myself that are still at Berkeley are now getting drawn into it. And normally when you have a case like this, you hire uh, uh, an outside expert to come in and uh, you know, make your case for you. But the University of California didn't have the money to pay for an expert witness. And so I got to be an expert witness. Um, and uh, so now we, we start off and there have to be things called depositions where uh, the, the, the two sides, you know, basically try and make their case. And, uh, you're, you know, the two sides get to really drill down into the people, into the experts. And uh, the, uh, the university was kind of dicey about, you know, wh why should we bother, you know, defending this, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, OK, they're going to do it. Um, and so I'm, I'm in my deposition. And uh, the, in my case, there's two lawyers. There's, on one side of me is the lawyer for UC Berkeley. And on the other side is the lawyer for BSDI because they sort of they've jointly are now in defense. And there's the, the person that's deposing me, who's this super high powered deposing person against little me who's never done this before. And uh, so they, they asked me a question and the, the lawyers are allowed to object to the question. Uh, 
And ultimately, I'm going to always I'm going to have to answer it. But then the judge will get to decide whether my answer can be used. So the BSCI lawyer jumps in and goes, that's a ridiculous question, blah, 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 you know, on and on back and forth. And they, you know, finally gets to, you know, why it isn't and why I shouldn't have to answer it and so on. And, uh, you know, so then uh, he asked me to question again. And now the Berkeley lawyer jumps in and th th this the the guy that's doing the deposing loses it, which is pretty amazing because they're paid not to lose it. And he just looks at the two lawyers and says, ladies, let him answer the damn question. Neither of the two women lawyers appreciated being called ladies by this gentleman from New York. And uh, I just saw Mary McDonald, the, the Berkeley lawyer, I just saw her sort of almost putting her fingers through the table. And at that point, I knew that the University of California was going to back us up and, and follow through on this case because she was not about to let them get away with that. Um, so after that, uh, things went forward. And uh, eventually, we, there's, there's another ruling. And that's the one where the judge says, look, this really should be done in state court first. And the, of course, you, you can't file in multiple states. So whatever state it gets filed in first is the one where it has to be heard. Well, the people, the AT&T is based in New Jersey. And so they, their state court is going to open three hours before the state court in California does. So almost certainly they've got the weekend. They're going to have that case in at 9 a.m. on Monday morning so that they can establish New Jersey as the state. But for whatever reason, they didn't do that. And so at 9 a.m. in California, they still hadn't filed in New Jersey. So boom, the University of California filed uh, in the, the court in Oakland, uh, which happened to be across the street from the headquarters of the UC system. And uh, so voila, now it's going to be heard in California. And so um, and, the, and the first thing that they do is it's now the university on offense against AT&T. And so they filed a claim saying, you know, these... AT&T has done all these horrible things. They've taken our code. Uh, they haven't given us due credit. They, you know, are now trying to sue us for stuff that, you know, they're not even, you know, isn't even theirs. Because uh, it turned out they thought that it was TCPIP that was theirs that we had stolen from them because they'd ripped all the copyright notices off. Uh, and anyhow, uh, the, uh, the upshot of this is that uh, they the two sides decide to go into negotiations and the negotiations go on for quite a while, but uh, they're not really getting very far. But then um, Ray Norda uh, ends up buying uh, Unix. Uh, and uh, so uh, he, and, and he decides that, uh, you know, it's better off to, to fight in the marketplace and not in court. And so he essentially tells the, the, USL negotiators that they, they need to just settle it. And so ultimately, um, we get into a room and it's like we have to, you know, figure out exactly what we're going to do. And, you know, it's Mike and I are like looking at each other. It's like, you know, <laughs> there really isn't anything that needs to be taken out. And so we go into a little nego uh, talk with our lawyer and she says, look, find three things and just get rid of those. And uh, so, you know, that, 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 that'll, that you don't care about much about. And so, you know, we went in and, and uh, you know, picked three files and said, all right, you know, we'll, we'll throw those out. Uh, and so that was basically the settlement. And uh, so then we were allowed to do a new release. Uh, we decided that we would get the license, you know, we would actually go through and get new licensing for that. So that was what finally then came out as 4.4 uh, .4 BSD dash light, L-I-T-E, uh, because it didn't have the last few bits of, of uh, code that we had agreed to take out. Uh, we also had to add about 90 copyrights, but they were all copyrights uh, that you know, didn't require any uh, licensing to, to use. Uh, so uh, if you look in some of the header files in sys, sys, for example, uh, you know, like mount.h probably, or and some of the ones that would have been in the original system, uh, you'll see AT&T copyrights at the top of them, but then saying that you're allowed to use them. 
So I've clearly way overrun my 45 minutes or whatever it was supposed to be. Uh, but why don't I stop there and, and take any questions? And you can run long. We're not, we don't have a hard stop. So. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I see in the question box, there's one that says, can you comment on the possibly apocryphal story about a truck that happened to drive by and actually dropped off some VMS tapes with virtual memory subsystem code? Um, Why, well, yes, I could do that. Uh, rolling back in my story, uh, I said there was a, uh, a point where uh, DARPA was trying to decide between whether they would use VMS or Unix. And so a guy named Dave Cashton, who was the, the person who was advocating that they should use VMS, uh, decided to write up a paper on why they should use VMS. And the crux of this paper was uh, a set of 10 bench, what we would today call micro benchmarks uh, that he, would, he ran both on BSD and on VMS. And micro benchmarks were things like how, how many get PIDs can you do per second? Uh, and uh, how many context switches can you do per second? So you'd, you'd set up uh, a, a pair of pipes or a socket between two processes and you'd send one byte back and forth between the two. Uh, and so it was just basically spending all its time context switching back and forth between the two processes. And so, and, 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 and naturally VMS, you know, beat Unix hands down on every one of these 10 micro benchmarks. He probably had some more that it didn't, so he didn't include those. Uh, at any rate, this report comes in uh, and, and Bill Joy, who's running the project at the time, gets this report and he's just, uh, Bill is a very animated person to begin with. And so he's reading this report and he's not just sort of sitting there quietly reading it and turning the pages. Like he reads a page and he takes his pen out and circles something and goes, this is really ridiculous. Rip, throws that page out, starts in on the next one. Oh, this is even worse. I mean, who cares how fast you can do get PID? Um, so anyway, uh, he, he sets about uh, the way you you deal with things like this, and that is you hack special purpose code to make those particular benchmarks run really fast. So, you know, get PID. Well, you know, turns out you only have to do that system call once, and then you can just cache it as a local variable because your PID isn't going to change on you. And so, you know, you do one system call and then you just take it out of that memory. And then, of course, it's blindingly fast because you're not doing system calls. Uh, at any rate, of nine of the 10 benchmarks, he, he gets down, you know, at least as good, if not better than what VMS did. But the one that's testing the context switch rate just cannot get it up. It's, it's, it's about half the context switch rate of, of VMS. And, you know, it's special purpose code that, you know, that's down in the, the low core dot S. It's just a sequence of instructions and, you know, you, you can scratch your head as much as you want, but how are you going to, how are you going to do it any quicker? And uh, I, there was some lamenting that went on with, you know, talking to some folks that we knew at DAC, uh, you know, and uh, at any rate, uh, there was, there's this circle that was out in front of Evans Hall. And uh, it, a lot of that's been built over now, but it, it's sort of still there. At any rate, uh, uh, delivery trucks would come around and they would, you know, drop off like mail or packages or whatever for each of the, the four buildings that were sort of around that circle. And so this, this truck pulls up in front of, uh, from, of the, of Evans and, you know, we're walking back from lunch coming into the building and uh, they have sort of that little tailgate and the, the, there's a set of boxes and, and one of the boxes falls off and, and then the truck drives away and, um, so it's like, oh, this paper probably supposed to deliver this. So we look on it and uh, well, there's, there's, it's, we can't figure out who it's supposed to be delivered to. So, well, maybe if we open the box, you know, there'll be like a packing list inside. We'll be able to figure out who it ought to go to. And uh, uh, it looks like it must've been supposed to go to the library because it's filled with microfiche. And uh, well, let, let's go in the library and put the microfiche in. Maybe, you know, we look at it, it'll be obvious, you know, what it is and who it ought to get go to. And uh, the very first microfiche we put into the reader turns out to be the assembly language in VMS that does context switching. I don't know how that happened, but anyway, um, uh, 
we, we pack it all back up and uh, turn it into the library because, you know, most likely they were the ones that were supposed to get it, I guess. Uh, at any rate, we know nothing about it after that. But very unsurprisingly, uh, BSD's context switch starts to go at exactly the same speed as the one in BMS. Uh, so I guess that should hopefully answer your question. Okay. Um, Next question is uh, from YouTube. Where did Mount Zainu fit in? Uh, Mount Zainu actually started back in well before uh, a lot of these other pieces took place. Uh, what was happening was in the original release, 4.3 BSD, uh, it was you know not fully polished, let's just say. And uh, there were a lot of people that were getting vaxes and they need they, they wanted to run bsd on it but if they didn't have the exact machines that we had at berkeley uh then they often had trouble getting it up and running and so a set of people that had been in the system administration group at berkeley uh decided to start their own company to provide support for people that wanted to use bsd help them get it up on their machines if they had specialized hardware, they could help them write device drivers for it. Uh, and also to just, it, Unix was changing very rapidly at that point in time. And so each time Berkeley would do a new release, they would then get that release brought out and integrated into their, their customers' uh, systems. And they needed to come up with a name for the company. And uh, they did, you know, originally you, you'd want to have something that sort of had Unix in the name, but they could, if you had Unix, then you had to have a little thing that said Unix is a trademark of AT&T. Uh, so they decided to, uh, to just do it backwards. And so uh, Mount Zainu is Unix TM backwards. And that's where the name came from. All right. Surely we have some more questions here. I'm looking over on IRC to see if I can see what else you might have. Oh, uh, here comes one. How hard would it be to implement a system call to link a file descriptor to a normal file in a directory on the same file system? I think they mean something like flink, where you have an unlinked file that's been deleted, but you still have an open file descriptor to it. And ah. Reinstantiate a directory entry forward in the file system. Um, that would not be difficult to do. Uh, the, uh, I mean, you you might have some security implications there, because, for example, someone might have passed you a file descriptor to give you access to something, but you know they don't want you to, you know, have a long term copy of it or something. But on the other hand, I mean. You could just make a copy of it. So I don't really see how it would be that horrendous. But I would want to think about it before I would implement something like that because uh, you know there could be some evil way that you could do something with something like that. OK, um, what about the mock operating system? Where does that fit in? Also, what was lost in BSD as a result of the lawsuit? Um, the, well, I'll answer the what was lost in BSD as a result of the, the lawsuit was uh, the things that we really hated uh, that we emulated in uh, System 5, and that was Shamem and uh, the, the, uh, the shared locking thing that they had and whatever the other third one of those is. I, I don't remember right off the top of my head now. Uh, Unfortunately, those were used enough that uh, eventually they, those those features got re-implemented. But that was actually some years down the line, uh, and that that was actually done not at Berkeley. Once once that BSD got released, um, it was done by you know FreeBSD or NetBSD or one one of the BSDs, and then propagated to the rest of them. And what about the mock operating system? Where does that fit in? So one of the, the big things that was, was very popular uh, in the 80s, uh, there were actually two things, both of which I thought were horrendous ideas that got beat upon endlessly. 
Um, one was this notion of a microkernel. So you have a, the, your kernel is really just uh, uh, scheduling and uh, VM management and maybe a bit of device driver stuff. Uh, but everything else runs out in user land. So your, your file systems are out there, your networking stacks are out there, uh, and then everything is done with message passing. So instead of having uh, subroutine calls or system calls, you're, you're doing message passing. And so of course the message passing needs to be blindingly fast and uh, inevitably is you're, you're never gonna get it to the point where it's as fast as doing a subroutine call or a system call. And so uh, the, we, we weren't huge fans of that. Oh, and distributed shared memory was the other one that was just like an idea that, that just never caught on because you, you know, the, the overhead of you know, every time you took a page fault, having to go to some other machine to get the answer was just not plausible uh, as, as being usable. Anyway, uh, but, you know, so, so Mach was all about the microkernel, but they needed all those other things that were uh, like file systems and so on. And so they took BSD and kind of put that on top uh, of the, the, the Mach microkernel. Well, the... Uh, the upshot of that was that we wanted to uh, take the, the VM system that they had, but of course that was all this you know, message passing stuff. So we took that out of the microkernel and put it in as the VM in the, in the BSD kernel. Uh, but then on top of it, we changed it from the, the whole message passing thing to, to the interface we have today, which is mmap and mprotect and you know, the, the, the M set of uh, system calls. And uh, the, there was a lot of stuff that was in there that uh, was, was ideas that they'd had that they tried out and didn't, you know, might or might not be particularly useful, but the code was still there. So there was a whole lot of stuff, for example, to have an external pager so that when you take a page fault, uh, it would send a message over and let some user level process deal with handling the page fault. And then it would send back and say, okay, it's been dealt with now. Uh, you can imagine how unreliable that could get. And so uh, we, we just lopped that off. But there was all the code inside the VM system that was uh, you know, designed to handle the fact that paging might be an event that was going to be handled you know, externally and so on. And uh, even though we didn't have any intent of having that happen, we still went through all of the overhead of having that stuff there. So uh, David Greenman Lawrence basically went through and just at some point just got rid of all that. So he just sort of roto-rooted uh, what was in the, the VM system and uh, got it down to sort of the core of what we, we think of uh, today. And of course, you know, others like Alan Cox and Caustic have done huge amounts of work uh, to add things like uh, super pages and uh, a lot of other uh, functionality to the to the uh, VM system, uh, so it's evolved a great deal over time. So it doesn't really look very much like the mock VM system anymore, but uh, it, uh, it that's where it started from. Okay, uh, do you miss any Vax features when porting to other architectures? Uh, there were. Um, uh, the, some inst the, the VAX was the you know the, sort of the the extreme of of complex instruction architectures. Well, that's actually not true because the Intel architecture is way outstripped in terms of number of instructions, different instructions. But at the time, it was way out in the lead, and you know it had instructions like CRC that would do a CRC calculation for you and. Uh, there was, but there, there were some string instructions which were quite handy, like find first set, which would find, you know, you, you'd give it a, a vector and it would find the first bit that was set in that vector. Uh, and so, you know, it, you still see vestiges of where we utilize those instructions. Uh, the, uh, when, when you wanted to use one of the VAX instructions, we would write it as a, a subroutine call. So you would just say FFS and give the arguments. And so that would push the arguments onto the stack uh, and then call that function. And then we would run a post processor over it, uh, a, a 
a, a well-known post processor called sed and it would look for the places where you called that uh, function and it would replace the call to the function by the in, the instruction uh, the magic instruction on the vax and then that was later done where instead of pushing things on the stack it moved them into registers and made it go quicker uh, etc but uh, the point was that you know, we sort of had some of those VAC special instructions, uh, you know, power factored into uh, our system. And, you know, today they're just functions like the way they're written. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, it was faster when you actually had the instruction on the VAX that would do it. Um, but other than that, the, uh, you know, the, the move forward uh, in, in uh, the, the way that paging works and so on, uh, you know, the VAX was very well designed for a 32-bit architecture, but uh, what we have in it wouldn't work all that well in a 64-bit architecture today. So, uh, for the most part, other than the, the vestiges of some of those instructions, not really too much of the VAX that I still would go back to. If I had to write an assembly language, of course I'd love it, but thankfully I don't have to do that much anymore. Um, if you could redo the FFS on disk format, what if anything would you change? Uh, the, the only thing that I'm really gunning for right now is that the inode number should be 64 bits. Uh, so that of course would change the format of directories uh, and a few other things. Uh, most of the rest of the changes that I wanted, basically I got put in when we did FFS2. Uh, so we went to, 64-bit uh, block pointers and increased the size of inodes and got external uh, data, which unfortunately got lobotomized, so it can only be used for uh, extended credentials. But uh, it was originally designed like the file forks in, in Apple's OS, where you can put sort of arbitrary things out there. Uh, so I guess that's, you know, the, other than that, I that the, the, there's nothing else that majorly I would want to change. Uh, there's always been a question, I guess, of, of going to an extent-based uh, block numbering, but you know, at this point in time, it, it, that doesn't seem to be all that useful. Okay, how does L4 IPC compare to mock IPC? Uh, Is that like SCL4 maybe? I'm not sure what John is asking. I assume he means the socket interface, level four. Oh, oh okay. Um, they're they're really quite different. I, the, the 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 mock IPC is active messages. So when you you send something in, uh, I guess you you could sort of say it's like a datagram uh, in the socket interface where you, you put it in and it's you know, a local address. So it's just going to a different port on your machine. Uh, that's sort of be the closest analogy I could think of to the, the mock IPC. But the, the, the mock IPC has all these, uh, you know, mailbox and notification and other things, um, which, I mean, we have mechanisms in the, in the OS now that, that could do those things, but uh, not nearly in the efficiency that mock had it done because they, they I mean they really had to tune that thing down to to get those things through the kernel as fast as possible all right true or false sys slash q.h started out life as a simple wrapper over early vax instructions um I well I was the one that first wrote q.h um, and we had list and tail queues, and that was it. Uh, actually, we had a thing called circle queues, but that that was a dumb idea and got dropped fairly quickly. Uh, and the thing that motivated me to write it was because uh, essentially every time I wanted to do a linked list, I had to go find a place in the kernel where we already had one and pick up those four lines of code and then edit them to be the right thing. And I'm like, I'm really tired of doing this. And so I simply came up with a way of codifying them in the, in the macros. Uh, and uh, so 
in fact, the, the tail queue macros is, is essentially what I originally did. And then it became clear that there were places where we didn't want to waste the, the, the memory. And so the, the list got added second. But the, the, there were no VAX instructions that particularly made that harder or easier to do. So uh, I would say it, that was really just a thing because I was sick and tired of cutting and pasting. Uh, I had no idea, of course, that it would grow to the to the level of what it is today. It, it's amazing to me to to look at that, and it's just like, oh my god! I look at the original one, and it was like a hundred lines, and this this one, you know, it looks like War and Peace when you go to read it, which is not bad. I mean, I'm glad that people thought it was a good idea, and if you notice, even Linux picked it up, uh, although they they're about 15 years behind the ones that we have. Maybe someday they'll pick up some of the other stuff. All right. Um, do you ever feel behind in how fast technology moves and seeing so much of it? Uh, actually, you know, very few people uh, get to work on essentially the same thing through their whole career. Uh, and in fact, most people would probably shudder at, you know, having to work on the same thing through their whole career. But I'll argue that you know, the things I was working on in the 80s wasn't the same as the 90s and it wasn't the same as the 00s and so on. Uh, so, uh, you know, it is exciting to both have the technology moving quickly around you and yet still being able to ride the wave on and on and on and on. Um, what really helps is the fact that there's the FreeBSD project and there's all these people that are younger and more nimble than me that are really the ones that are keeping on top of that technology. So now it's more a matter of sitting and watching the fast technology of all than you know, actually having to dive in. You know, there's still a few places where I, I will go in and, and you know, lob in some suggestions and about half the time people will go, what are you thinking? You're like, oh yeah, never mind." And then the other time they go, well, that might have some merit. You know? And so some of those things are, are still going in. And, and there's some things that people just really don't want to look at at all, like FSCK. And so when, when one of those breaks, it's like, <laughs> McCusick, fix it. <laughs> but, uh, and, and even there, you know, that's, that's a lot of technology. I mean, it, things like trim didn't exist, you know, 20 years ago. And so a lot of the stuff that has to go in to deal with that uh, is, is things that, uh, I've actually had a bit of a hand in, but uh, generally speaking, uh, it 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 is it's very cool to be able to watch the technology go by and seeing how it's being adapted and used. Uh, and so I feel very lucky to be where I am in that regard. Okay, the i four microkernel family. So I think this was L4. I think John was saying, or, or Jan, oh. uh, I think what he was saying was he was talking about IPC and the L4 microkernel, which I am not familiar with. So I have no idea how it might compare to the IPC that was in mock. Yes, I, um, I, I'm with you on that. I, I have not studied L4 at all. So, okay. Um, should the kernels get headers for any other data structures like Q.H and Tree.H? Uh, undoubtedly it should, uh, but, and, and in fact, things like that are coming in, uh, but they, they don't have nearly the, the broad level of, uh, applicability across, uh, you know, large parts of the system. I mean, Q.H gets used not only in the kernel, but also gets used in a lot of user code as well. And, uh, the uh, you know, there's relatively few things that have such a, a broad usage base, but there you know, you know, all kinds of little things have come in over time um, that that kind of codify uh, things that that do get used in in several places in the kernel, and and so that kind of refactoring I think is is ongoing. Um, it just isn't quite as obvious. Uh, so some of the things that get refactored bubble up because they turn out once they've been refactored to have much broader applicability than they were originally intended for. Uh, and, you know, so undoubtedly some of those are there or will be there and will eventually percolate up. Okay, um, will checksumming be part of UFS3? The, the short answer to that is no. Uh, 
uh, there was one time there was a time when I thought that that was something that would in fact be useful to do. And I've come to realize that uh, there are uh, we really have two major local file systems in FreeBSD, UFS and ZFS. And uh, ZFS being non-overwriting file system technology, it's just way, way, way easier to do checksumming in that kind of a technology of a file system. Because once something is written, you know it's never going to be overwritten. So the checksum for it is going to be accurate for as long as it's valid data. Uh, and secondly, you want the checksum not to be in the data block that you're checksumming. It needs to be elsewhere. Uh, and ZFS is set up perfectly to do that. To overhaul UFS to be able to do that would require a great deal of added, a, a, a great deal of changes and a lot more code. And, uh, and it, to boot in an overwriting file system, it, it's just not as going to be as reliable because of constantly needing to have things change, overwriting things, and then having to get the checksums to change and keeping those things in sync. And then you need a log to do that. And it, it's just, it's way too much work. Um, so really, uh, I now view UFS not as the end-all be-all file system for every use, which is what it started out as, but rather as a small, very efficient file system. So for small file systems, embedded systems, where you don't need all the functionality and reliability of ZFS. If what you need is that level of reliability, you should be using ZFS. Uh, so if, if you want and need the, the, the reliability of checksums, use ZFS, because that's they do it better than I could ever do it in UFS. And uh, so, my, so my goal uh, has been to uh, not add more features to, to UFS, but rather to uh, make what we already have there run absolutely as, as fast as possible, uh, but still to keep its footprint down. Uh, so, you know, if you take out the, the ability to do snapshots, you take out uh, the journaling, you take out the soft updates, you know, you don't enable those options. The, 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 the core UFS is actually pretty tiny still. And uh, you know, it, it would it would clock in at around ten thousand lines of code compared to, for example, ZFS, which is seven hundred and fifty thousand lines of code. Uh, so, you know, if if space is an issue, uh, then uh, UFS UFS is there to to help you out with that. Uh, the other thing is that you know, when you get to super huge file systems, again, the, the, you know, if it takes you twenty four hours to run FSCK on it then that's just not a viable thing to do. Whereas with ZFS, you, you still have the equivalent of FSCK, but it's called scrub and it just kind of runs in the background and it can start and stop. And, uh, you know, yeah, sure. It takes a couple of days to perhaps or maybe a week to scrub the whole thing. But, you know, the fact that the system got rebooted or, you know, you had to stop it because, you, you know, the system was too busy. You didn't want to burn the, the IO cycles at that point in time. That's all doable. And, and to try and do that with FSCK is just not plausible. So um, acknowledge that the things that ZFS is good at is, is you know, it's good at. And if, the, if you need those kind of features, then you should be running ZFS because presumably you will have a 64-bit processor and you will have 64, you know, gigabytes of memory to support it and, and you know, so on. And then, you know, but you're not going to be running ZFS in your wristwatch, you know. Probably not even going to be running UFS in your wristwatch, but whatever. Okay, so in, in moving forward with UFS three, um, if you heard my talk maybe a decade ago, I would have I had a much different list of things that I wanted to put in there than what I want to put in today. So I, where where it's easy to do things checksumming, it's actually check CRCs, but uh, for things like inodes. Um, they're in there for the super blocks, for the cylinder groups. So some of those core things where it's, it's easy to do it, it's there now. Uh, and in places where it requires using a journal to track the changes, it's not in and probably never will be. There, that's how to spend 10 minutes on a 30 second question. Oh, that's fun. Um, we do have a couple of questions from YouTube. So and I wanna be a good custodian of your time since you're giving us so much time today. 
Um, so maybe a question from YouTube. My uh, Kevin Bowling had asked, were there any other protocol war protocol wars that happened during CSRG aside from TCP/IP? Um, other protocol wars. There, I mean, yes, but they they were much more niggling. Um, I mean, there were a lot of the RFCs that came out in that era. So, for example, a bunch of things having to do with with SMTP with mail systems. Uh, we had a lot of debates going back and forth on uh, some of the things, some of the uh, uh, things like slow start and how that ought to be implemented and Nagel's algorithm and, and things like that. But, you know, those mostly got, uh, you know, they, they were a little like side skirmishes. There wasn't just the, the huge headbutting um, that we had with the, the original TCP IP. I think we learned something from that original TCP IP. I mean, you know, I, to honestly, we at Berkeley did not do a very good job of handling that uh, from start to finish because we just didn't even realize it would be an issue. And so, you know, having learned that lesson, we made sure to cut those kind of things off at the pass by getting everybody engaged early on before people were in entrenched positions. Okay, uh, what can you tell us about gaming console specific optimizations for FFS? I assume you're talking about the Sony PlayStation. Um, I, I, Sony PlayStation uh, uses FreeBSD, as I assume people know, and uh, they had originally planned to do their own file system, but the, the, they got kind of stuck and they were needing to ship and it wasn't working. Uh, but they needed to uh, get something going. And one of the things they needed was that each level in a game had to be contiguous on the disk so they could just seek around and you know, directly manipulate the disk rather than have to go through the file system. So they needed uh, 10 megabyte disk blocks. And so I had to do some work to help them be able to get FFS to do that for them. Um, but that's the only optimization that, that I was involved in. Other than that, it pretty much just worked for them as far as I know. Uh, any hints on PS5 file system? Are they still using UFS? Uh, I have not been contacted by them, so I do not know the answer to that. Um, well, I think because we're getting a little late and we had, <clears throat> there's one last question I wanted to ask you. It actually came from Emmanuel Vado on IRC, who hacks on graphics and things, but it's a bit of a forward looking question. So let me read it correctly so that I don't misstate it. Um, so Manu says, a question for Kirk, as an old timer, and he said I had to use those words, sorry. Um, how do you feel about FreeBSD today and the other BSDs? For example, how do you feel in terms of the direction that we take? And that can be either technical or how we do our project management. Uh, what are your kind of thoughts about where the projects are and where they're going? Well, I, I for a long time, I sat on the mailing list of all three projects and uh, you know, would lob in unrequested comments to all of them. Uh, at some point I managed to, uh, fall out of favor on the OpenBSD folks. So I, I'm no longer on that mailing list, but uh, I, you know, I, I essentially aligned myself most fully with, with FreeBSD because they were in closest alignment to what I wanted to see happen, which was I wanted to get used by as many people as possible. And uh, uh, I was, you know, the original focus of FreeBSD was to get it out onto PCs and just, you know, really support it and really have it easy to load and so on and so forth. Um, and, it, you know, FreeBSD has been fairly pragmatic about that. The, the NetBSD people, I, I mean, my hats are off to them. They've done some really good work, they, especially the stuff they did to support multiple architectures, much of which has been uh, adopted by FreeBSD. Uh, so, you know, I see a lot of flow of stuff back and forth um, between the projects and even OpenBSD, we, we get, you know, they, they do some security things that we definitely uh, adopt as well. So um, I don't have, I, 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 although I don't do a lot with the other two BSDs, I, I nevertheless, um, I'm, I'm glad they're there because they, they're doing useful stuff and, and we're getting, FreeBSD is managing to take advantage of it. 
As for FreeBSD itself, I've spent, a, you know, obviously a great deal of time on this project, much longer than I did at CSRG. And a lot of what I've dealt with over the years has been sort of governance to, to move away from the grand omnipotent high stomper model and to you know, move away from uh, core for life and those kinds of things. And you know, I think that has served the project well. Uh, and you know, my goal was that you know, when, I'm, when I'm not doing this anymore, that BSD will continue. And, and I, I have a great deal of confidence at this point that FreeBSD is going to continue, you know, even if I stop answering any email. So uh, you know, in that sense, I'm, I'm as the long-termer, I'm very happy with, with the fact that it's going, that it, it really seems to have a, you know, a lot of, of energy going into it. You know, we are continuing to bring new people onto the project. You know, the average age of the project has gone up a bit, but if you just get rid of some of us old geezers that skew it way high, um, we, we actually have, you know, people in, you know, the core of the project are people in their prime uh, coding years, which are in their, you know, late 20s, 30s, and early 40s. So it's, uh, fr from that sense, you know, there's all kinds of new and wonderful stuff that's coming in. And, and I'm glad to see it, even if I don't understand it. <laughs> um, I'm going to just answer one last top question here. Do, do you regret features you added later to UFS after the initial release? Absolutely, I do. Um, snapshots is something that had I known that ZFS was going to come along and do them, I never would have done them because they're, they're slow and clunky. And uh, it, that's one of the features like checksumming that, you know, if, if what you want is snapshots, by golly, go, go use ZFS because a non-overrating file system can just do that so much more efficiently than, than, I, than, than UFS can, any overwriting file system can. Um, other than that, uh, the, the, the fact that the external data stuff got, you know, hijacked to, to do, you know, nothing but, you know, extended uh, access lists annoys me, but, you know, that is what it is. And it's, yeah, unless I had a time machine and could go back and fix it, uh, uh, that, that's something that I wish had gone in a different direction. All right. I, I, I do believe I am now about half an hour past where I was supposed to be. So uh, what would you have changed if you'd gotten 48 bits instead of 32 bits for layer three addressing? Uh, don't ask me, I'm not a networking person. I just play one on the net. Ask someone like George Neville Neal. I'm sure he could answer that question for you. <laughs> all right. Um, well, thank you so much for your time today, Kirk. Uh, we all enjoyed it. Several folks on IRC have told me explicitly to tell you thank you, because we really Thanks. appreciate it. Um, I know I've had the pleasure of, of listening to you at previous conferences, and we always enjoy story time um, and hearing about uh, how things went in the past, but also how they still continue to go. We always value your input, too, about uh, the project's future, where you're going, both as a member, but also as a member with a really long view. You have a lot of wisdom stored up, and we appreciate it when you share it with us. So well, always thank a you. pleasure having you. Thank you for that. I, I appreciate, you know, I like to say that, you know, I've been around as long as dinosaurs and mainframes ruled the earth. And uh, so it's always good when, you know, some of the, some other people say, that's, that's okay, you know, they're gone, but, you know, we're still here. So, <laughs> all right. Take care, and we'll see you all tomorrow, and yeah. maybe in the hallway. Yeah, so thanks, everybody, for coming to the Dev Summit today for our first day. So we will start again tomorrow at about the same time as yesterday. Uh, the hallway track is still open. I don't know how much longer. It'll probably be open for a little while after this, but we'll see you all tomorrow. So thank you all for coming. And thanks for organizing, John, and all the rest of the people behind the scenes that made it work. Uh, yes. Thank you again to our team so, and, and all of them that helping out a bunch today, helping all our transitions go smoothly. So hopefully I'll leave my YouTube off tomorrow and we'll have an echo at the start. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, bye.